There he is. Okay. Okay, Mr. Marshall, I see it's 6.33. You have a quorum of planning board members. Amherst Media is with us here. Uh, you look good to go to me. All right, thank you, Pam. Welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of January 17th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Coldham. Here. Uh, Jesse Major. Major. Present. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Um, Fred, uh, Fred Hartwell is absent, and Karen Winter is absent as well. I, Doug Marshall, am present, and Johanna, Win Johanna Newman. Present. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please, wish, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines, or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the time is 6.36, and we are now at the first item on our agenda for this evening, uh, and that is minutes to be approved. We have the minutes from November 15th of last year. Uh, does anyone on the board have any comments on those minutes? Janet, if I it, I looked like maybe you made uh, uh, said something, but you were muted. No, I didn't say anything. I, I have no comments. They look good to me. Okay, all right, Bruce. Uh, I move to adopt the minutes as presented. Okay, Johanna. I second the motion. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, any any last chance to make some comments? Anybody want to do that? All right, then we'll go through a roll call for the for these minutes of November 15th. Bruce? Aye. And Jesse? 
Aye. Uh, Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's five in favor with two absences. All right, so that uh, those are the only minutes for approval for this meeting. We'll go on to public comment period. So I'm seeing, typically I read the names of the people I can see who are attending from the public. And I will read those names now. I see nine people, uh, Alan Snow, Bill Brown, David Loring, Janet Bernardo, Rick Rice, Robert Parent, Tim Cooper, Tom Reedy, and William Brown. Okay, so members of the public, would anyone like to make a comment on a topic that is not on tonight's agenda at this time? Okay, I guess we will move on. I don't see any hands raised from the public. All right, at this time, we will go to item number three on the agenda, and the time is now 6.39. This is a joint public hearing with the tree warden. So Pam, if you would please bring the tree warden over into mm -hmm. the, the participants. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40, Chapter 5C, Scenic Roads, and Chapter 87, Paragraph 3, Shade Trees, this joint public hearing of the Planning Board and Tree Warden has been duly advertised in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and posted on the town's electronic calendar. And this concerns Site Plan Review 2024-04, and special permit 2024-03 with the town of Amherst at 70 Southeast Street. This concerns scenic road removal to allow re relocation of a site access drive to mitigate congestion due to proximity to the Main Street East Street intersection at South 70 Southeast Street, map 15A, parcel 47, Public shade trees impacted by this project include the following trees. One multi-stem maple with uh, stems of 18, 18, 12, and 10 inches. All, that, all, all those numbers consisting of the diameter of the uh, stem at approximate breast height. And one 24 inch ash which may be required to be removed for safety. Do we have any board member disclosure associated with this hearing? I do not see any. Uh, in that case, uh, Chris, are we gonna go on to the applicant presentation? And would that be Alan or someone else? You are muted, Chris. It could be either Alan or Tim Cooper, but I, I think it should probably be Alan. Okay. Mr. Snow, welcome to our planning board meeting. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so if it might be Tim Cooper. Tim Cooper is part of the, um, the uh, project. So Tim may want to give the actual presentation why they need to, you know, why they're proposing to remove those trees for the um, the driveway. Okay. Um, All I right. can give well, you the quick one, but you'd give you more details. All right, uh, Tim, I see you and the participants. And so welcome also, and tell us what you're trying to do. Uh, thank you, I can, uh, uh, can I share my screen uh, to just to bring up the location? And I also yeah. have, uh, I just want to mention in the gallery, we have our design team. Rick Rice is also with the NISCO. David Loring, Bill Brown, and Janet Bernardo are all part of the design team. So if you, you want to bring them in or not, uh, I, they okay. will be helpful in this or the next hearing for questions. 
I do I understand that you're with Denisco Design? I am the project architect manager with Denisco Design, correct. Thank you. Can, would you like me to bring those folks over now or do you want to wait until we start? Sure. The, uh, they will, to, they to will start bringing them in. Okay, I will do that. Um, so here is a view of the existing condition and the trees in question. There are the two trees, one directly south of the existing north site egress, excuse me, um, which is the maple tree and then the Actually, ash, which is cool. Tim, um, could you give us some context for where this is on the overall site? Absolutely. So here is an overall site plan of the existing school uh, with the entrance at the south end and the egress to the north. All traffic currently enters at the south and exits to the north. Um, we are going to zoom in around this exit with the two trees that are just to the south of the exit, south of the Main Street, South Street intersection. So the intersection would be just where my cursor is, and this is the egress from the school. You can zoom out a little bit for context, excuse me. So the maple in question is just south of the existing drive and then the ash is at the corner of the site. So as part of the overall main project, this drive will be converted to an entrance and egress for staff and parent vehicles. So there will be three lanes it will be widened and moved to the south. So it will be moved away from the intersection at Main and Southeast Street. Um, that movement will move it into this maple tree. Uh, that movement is basically to mitigate the traffic concerns with the queue at that intersection. So we would like to move that entrance down to give a little more space. That is why that tree um, is slated to be removed with the current design. Um, the proximity to the ash tree and the condition of the ash tree and sight lines, uh, which we have to get out there and look at, may require that that ash tree uh, be removed too. But that is why we have made the application for both of those trees to be potentially removed. Uh, the maple tree with the current design definitely has to be removed. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to say in your introduction? I do not. It's a fairly straightforward part of the project compared to all of the other movie pieces. Okay. All right. Um, I know we had some, at least a couple of board members who made a site visit today. Um, do either or any of the folks who did want to say anything about the trees? All right. Bruce is shaking his head no. And I thought, Janet, you have your hand up. So I, I went and looked at the trees. Um, you know, the maple is clearly, if if you widen that exit or entrance in any way, um, definitely the maple tree came out. It wasn't clear to me from the map or from um, from like the location of the other tree. I didn't know where that tree was vis-a-vis -vis the new road. So, it, you know, I wondered if it could be saved, but I didn't have any like maps to say excuse me with this no, I'm sorry um so I wasn't sure it had to be removed because I wasn't really sure where the road was going to be so I didn't and I couldn't find a map that really showed that clearly I just had two small maps in my you know maps in my packet okay all right now and it sounds like uh Mr. Cooper isn't even sure that the ash will be affected or not at the moment so the um if I may respond to yes that. Uh, so the, the drive moved to the south, the curb line is right at the canopy edge. So depending on the health of the tree, it could very well survive. Um, but, you know, for the sake of safety, we would absolutely want to make sure that everything was healthy, not obstructing any views. Um, and before the decision was made to keep it, um, the view that is on the screen now shows the drive in the final position, which is widened to three lanes. Uh, so two can exit and one would come in. And the northernmost lane in the new position would be right in the stem of the existing maple tree. So that's why that 
Okay. Would want to go. And is the ash tree the species of ash that's subject to the emerald ash borer? That Bill Brown might know better than me, or would certainly know better than me if he has been left in, let in. Um, I couldn't Pam, remember. Have we, have, have we I, brought, brought Bill over or not? I knew there was one more person, but I couldn't remember yeah, which I one. I see a Bill Brown among the... No, um, he, should, and, he should be moving over. Great, here he is. And and I see that Steve Stanish is also, he is okay. part of the design team too. So if he could be let in, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. He's on his way too. And then um, Janet Bernardo, when I was trying to move her over, she was declining at this moment, so. Okay. All right, so uh, Mr. Brown, are you able to hear me and respond? Um, I am here, can you hear me okay? Uh, very faintly, you might get closer to your microphone. Okay. Um, that is a, is an ash tree, and we think it uh, is susceptible to uh, the ash borer. Um, it seems to be in fairly good condition now. Uh, we have graded the site so that we could save this tree. We've, we've attempted to save it as part of the plan. Um, but the concern is, you know, in the future as we're going through construction, um, we are staying, we are close to where the edge of the canopy is, um, but our concern is that over time, because of the ash borer and construction that's going on, uh, that it may need to be removed, but we're not certain at this time. Okay. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. So I just, I wanted to add that it does seem like a very sensible um, idea to move that exit or further south because it's a very tight I mean I've, you know my kids went to school there so there's a million times I was making a turn right or left and it's beca because it's so close to the intersection and there's not like a really clear left-hand turning lane or signal it is really kind of a very tight complicated sort of turn so making it further south I think would ease some of that on the other hand the trees are lovely the common is lovely we all you know and it, they look good so if they could save the ash you know that maybe we could do something saying you know give them permission to cut it down if needed with a with a preference to save it yes okay janet all right um we have very few members of the public left uh in fact uh I think I gather Janet Bernardo is part of the design team. Um, and I believe Tom Reedy is here for the second item on our agenda or third. And um, I'm not sure about Robert Parent, but uh, are there any members of the public who want to say anything about the this proposed impact on the trees? Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands from any of the three of them. Chris, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wondered what the um, what the tree warden's position is. I know we received a memo, which I think was included in your packet um, from a member of, or it was either included in your packet or it was emailed to you, um, from a member of the Public Shade Tree Committee who had comments um, Actually, he was reporting on what the Public Shade Tree Committee decided. So um, perhaps Mr. Snow would like to make a report about that and then tell you what his opinion is. Sure, Alan. Okay, um, so I would just say, I'd like to just follow up on a couple thoughts that came to mind over the tree itself. Um, this is the, the maple or the ash? The ash tree. Um, so unless, unless, you know, all ashes are susceptible to animal ash borer and um, unless the town wants to put in uh, funding to inject the tree to preserve it from emerald ash borer, then it will die eventually. Um, the, the tree is surrounded by probably half a dozen other large ash trees that are well in decline and, and dying from emerald ash borer. So it's just a, a matter of couple of years or so before that tree is in decline. So um, 
as, as far as the tree hearing goes, um, it's a healthy tree now. So we need a tree hearing for it. In two more years, I would probably be cutting it down because it's it's falling apart um, yep. over the public way. So um, I did meet with the public shade tree committee. We did discuss it. Um, I I was told essentially that there are two phases to this project, that there's sort of the temporary driveway fix, which is going to be um, all traffic coming in and out, in and out of the um, northernmost exit. Uh, so buses and 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 uh, non-school uh, non-school bus vehicles, parents, etc., cetera, um, pulling into the school. And the, the southern entrance is going to become the construction entrance. So for a period of probably two years, this area is going to be used as a, uh, to get in and out of the school uh, for day-to-day -day operations. And then after the, as the project gets close to finish, the drive will then be sort of moved again a little bit to reorientate it with the new sidewalk um, a little further south, uh, even further south than the expansion for the temporary driveway. So um, I, you know, the, the silver maple tree is perfectly healthy. Um, you know, it's growing, doesn't seem to have any structural problems at this, at this stage in its life. Um, they can get quite large and they have a, you know, a history of becoming very large and self-destructing if they're not cared for or improved um, because they do grow so fast that they are known to be weak wooded trees. So, um, but that's a long ways away and it's, it's a perfectly healthy tree. So um, the public safety committee, um, as you have in your packet, noted that they you know, were okay with the ash tree coming down, but they would like to see efforts made to kind of find another design to save the, the uh, silver maple. Um, if possible. Um, so that's their opinion. Um, I don't see how you know we can achieve the goals of expanding the driveway there in either direction without impacting significantly the root zone of that tree. You might believe the trunk standing, but I don't know how you get the the um, the temporary driveway in there. Um, so that would be up to that would be a design task that's uh, above my um, you know, ability. So if, unless it moves all the way to the south, the wood line to the south, um, I don't see how you can save that tree. Um, and the, save, the silver maple is the multi-stem maple? Yes. OK. Uh, Rick Rice, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to uh, be clear, the original impetus for removing the silver maple was the desire to move the north driveway curb cut as far south as the site plan would allow, which uh, br which brings it into conflict with the multi-stem silver maple. Uh, there is, and that is to get as much distance from the curb cut to the intersection as possible. Without doing that, there is no other design that's possible. The driveway would stay, have to stay where it was if, uh, to clear the tree and widening uh, the driveway temporarily could easily be accomplished by uh, going to the north instead of to the south, but we went to the south because that tree was uh, would have had to have come down anyway to uh, further the final design con configuration of the driveway. So for the again, for the purposes of the early site package, we can tell those bidders not to do what was shown, not to take that tree down, but instead widen the driveway to the north. But that still leaves us with an issue. Uh, of the driveway configuration with respect to the intersection to the north. Right. And I under, I assume there's not enough uh, frontage on this site to move this, the driveway entirely past the maple to the south. Is that right? Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, um, 
for the record, I guess I should say that uh, although I'm not a member of the school, uh, elementary school building committee, I have attended uh, all but probably three or four of the meetings that they've had in the past three years. So I'm uh, rather familiar with uh, the project. I haven't been uh, uh, participating beyond that, but uh, well, actually I have. But I do remember many of the uh, conversations, particularly around uh, uh, site selection, whether we would have the Wildwood site or the Fort River site. And one of the principal concerns uh, against having the Fort River site was the, con the, the, the problems of traffic management at this uh, uh, in and out of the site. And I, if Rupert Roy Clark, the building, uh, the superintendent of the schools, uh, sorry, the, the uh, maintenance department superintendent of the schools were here, he would express a very strong concern uh, about uh, trying to mitigate, uh, which is what the design team are doing here. So it's, uh, it's a serious problem uh, that is trying to be solved here. And it seems that the best solution is to move that driveway. So uh, I'm representing, I think, not just my own view here, but, but some of the other folks in the, uh, in, in, on the other committees who have been uh, uh, chiming in on this. And also my personal opinion, uh, as I saw that tree, it's a multi-stem tree. It's, it may be healthy, but it's not particularly attractive. Uh, I would think uh, under the circumstances, I would strongly support the removal of that tree and uh, and planting uh, another one that can uh, grow and uh, eventually look a lot nicer than that uh, multi-stem fellow that's uh, currently there. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Janet? You know, in terms of trying to move the... Um the exit entrance north, there's actually a little um, sidewalk there because a lot of kids come through that intersection. There's a monitor there. Um, and so you'd have to move into that sidewalk. And then right next to the sidewalk is a light pole and another tree. So you're kind of very constrained on going north. And I think going north just makes the traffic problem worse. Um, I've been there um, a few years ago, just looking at the site. And um, it was just when the buses were leaving and there, the, the custodian actually goes out there, stops traffic and lets all the buses leave at once. That doesn't help the parents, but it really was an extremely quick exit of all buses. So that was actually encouraging to see. So I, I do think that the South, you know, taking the two trees out is required. It'd be great. Or, you know, saying, you know, um, I mean, I would take out both trees and say plant something else to the south where the ash tree was that can live, you know? And so, you know, you'll keep the canopy going and have something nice for the future. I'm not sure what species, I'm not really an expert on that, but I know Alan has a big vision for the town. All right, thanks, Janet. Uh, I guess I will uh, show my hand here. I also support removing these trees. Uh, I agree uh, with Bruce's expression that the uh, traffic management at this site uh, is a major challenge. And um, anything we can do to allow that to be managed in as positive a way as possible, I will support. Are there other comments from board members at this point? Um, Chris and Alan, um, do we need a vote from the board approving the removal of these two trees? I um, I had one more question actually. Um, okay. I'd like to know uh, what are the plans, um, two concerns. One is um, what are their plans to replant trees either in or next to the public way so that we maintain tree canopy along that stretch of street? And then um, could they just briefly talk about the tree planting? Uh, how many trees have we planted in the new school area? Okay, Tim? I'm gonna ask Bill to answer that question. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? You're still a little faint, go ahead. I'm a little bit faint, I'll get closer then. Um, I haven't done an actual count on uh, the amount of trees um, that we're planting on site. Um, but I, I, it, it's roughly a hundred trees in total that are being planted on site, and we didn't consider putting 
trees along this edge because we didn't know if these the ash tree in particular uh, was going to be uh, taken out or not. But if it is, we can uh, certainly locate a tree uh, along the public way as a replacement for the ash that we're taking out. All right. Um, I guess, Alan, did you have any suggestions for species? Or Bill, did you have anything in mind? Alan, well, you can go first. Yeah, so I would just say that I'd be happy to work with them to you know select a location in the public way there where they can plant uh, you know one or two trees depending upon space and the species. Um, you know we can discuss that as I learn more about the details of uh, the construction. All right, so maybe we can make that a condition of our approval that uh, the applicant work with the tree warden to. Uh, identify and some and provide suitable a uh, couple of su suitable replacement trees sounds good okay uh any other comments from board members all right then i will uh imagine a motion um that we I, that we uh let's see that we approve removal of the multi-stem maple and the ash tree as requested by the applicant on the condition that the applicant work with our town tree warden to uh, provide at least one and probably two suitable replacement trees to be planted in the public way uh, as replacements. Chris, does that sound reasonable? And close the public hearing. And, oh yes, and close the public hearing. Thank you. All right, so let's, uh, as a motion, I'll make the motion. Jesse? I'll second. All right, thank you. Are there other board comments before we go run through a vote? All right, I'll uh, start with you again, Bruce. An aye is in favor of the motion and a nay is opposed. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Janet. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. I'm an aye as well. That's five in favor, two absences. Thank you, Alan, for joining us. So I'll just. um say that I am in favor of that motion as well, so. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, are there any uh, procedural things related to your hearing that we need to do? Uh, no. Okay, I th since I thought this was a joint hearing between you and us, so. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm part of the hearing. I, our, okay. I agree to remove the tree in my role as tree warden, I agree that the two trees should be removed. Um, okay, uh, you are welcome to stay for the as much of the rest of the meeting as you like. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, all right. Um, so the time now is 7.06 and uh, we will go on to the next public hearing. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. This is a, a joint public hearing for site plan review 2024-04 and special permit 2024-03 for the town of Amherst at 70 Southeast Street located at map 15A, parcel 47, uh, located in the RVC and FPC zoning districts. A joint public hearing to request site plan review approval under section 3.330 of the zoning bylaw to construct a three-story 105,750 gross square foot elementary school building 
with associated site improvements, including parking and athletic fields, and to request a special permit in accordance with section six, table three, footnote A of the zoning bylaw to modify maximum building height requirements and section 5.10 of the zoning bylaw to allow for the filling of land to raise the first floor elevation due to the high water table. Do we have any board member disclosures? All right, sounds like Janet has already disclosed that she had a child who went to the existing building. I'm not sure that <laughs> it really affects my decision that much. It gives me a, a granular level of detail on certain aspects, but. All right. Yeah, I think many of us have connections to this project, but I'm not sure any of them rise to the level of conflicts that we need to disclose. Okay. All right, so Tim, uh, why don't you come on back and um, make your presentation? Uh, thank you. Uh, just so it's clear, I was going to introduce our team. Bill Brown is landscape architect. Uh, Janet Bernardo and Steve Stanish are with Horsley Witten. They are our civil engineers. Uh, David Loring is with PAR. Uh, he's our traffic engineer. And Rick Rice is with Denisco as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to give uh, the overall overview of the project. And our team is here to answer any questions that I'm sure will come up. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, one second, I'm just going to share the presentation. There we go. There we go. So st starting with um, the existing Fort River School, uh, there's one story, 82,000 square foot footprint on a 31 acre site. Um, the existing school is sort of sprawling, uh, which means it's not really suited for uh, modern 21st century education. And a lot of the spaces are pretty far from exterior walls. So the lighting and the conditions within the school in general are, are not what uh, Amherst would hope for an elementary school. Um, on the existing site, as we talked briefly in the tree hearing, all traffic enters through the south and egresses at the north. Um, there is parking to the west and south of the building. Bus drop off is in the lane closest to the building on the west and parents drop off by circulating through the parking lot to the south and west of the building. There are playing fields and play structures all around the building. Um, to the east and south, there is a softball field on site with lights in a in, in field. Um, and there are basketball hoops on the pavement to the north of the building. The athletic fields that surround the building are um, not particularly well drained, and so they are subject to flooding for a lot of the year. And then I should mention to the east of the site is the Fort River, but it's a good ways into the tree line, which is separated from the school from um, the trees, and the, there's a fence, and then south of the site there is a fairing brook so there are setbacks um, and there are some natural resources some wetlands some habitat areas all of which are outside of the limit of work for the project but we will certainly be accommodating there is uh, some compensatory storage uh, some that we'll be doing some minor regrading uh, as the floodplain extends onto the site and we will be manipulating the ground within that but the building itself is outside of it Moving to the proposed site plan, um, we have separated uh, the vehicle traffic on site in the proposed plan. Parking for staff and parents will all enter and exit through the north entrance, which will be wide to three lanes. Uh, for parent drop off, uh, parents will come in, circulate through the lot and drop off at the west end of the building. 
traffic for that drop-off pattern will be going through the parking lot, but teachers will be in before drop-off and they will be leaving before. So there will not be active parking during that. All of which is to say that there will still be um, staff control of the drop-off situation uh, as there is now. The south, the southern entrance to the site will be dedicated to buses and service and vans. They will all loop through down here and be able to discharge students to either the door at the center of the building or the main entrance, depending on how staff wants to bring students into the building. Surrounding the building, there are areas for structured play directly north of the building and the cafeteria. There are basketball courts to the east of the building. All of this is on asphalt. The playground itself is on a resilient board in place surface. And then in addition to the outdoor play areas, there are programmed outdoor educational spaces. There is a forest floor garden. There is a planter garden, a pollinator garden, and a pavilion that is uh, size for one classroom to be outside. All of these amenities are focused on the southern half of the site so that the existing school represented by this dash line can operate with enough parking for the staff and enough play area for the children attending to operate close to normally while all of this is being constructed south of the construction fence. The school will be net zero. Um, so there is support for that goal with uh, PV on the roof and in the parking lot. Uh, the PV in the parking lot is supported by canopies. Uh, one of the things mentioned in the development report is that the canopy structures are within the 30 foot setback of the side property line here. Uh, that setback is doubled because of the use. Um, we do believe we can get to the typical 15 foot setback, uh, but 30 feet might be difficult. We could move this last bay south, but it's something we will have to talk about with the board. Um, in the introduction, we mentioned the other waivers that the project will be, special permits that the project will be seeking um, to mitigate the high groundwater on site. The existing first floor of the school will be two feet above the old Fort River School. So there was some fill to bring that building up. We will also be including under slab drainage to additionally mitigate the high water table. And then the red line that has appeared is the extent of the flood prone conservancy. So the building does extend into that. So we'll be seeking a special permit to have the east end of the building in that zone. So we, you know, some of the existing constraints we are working around on site, but bringing all of the building site amenities, things that are working for the program that we are looking to have operating on day one, that is why it's all clustered down to the site. So as soon as the school is built, there can be a seamless transition from the existing Fort River School to the new building. There are just some views of what the building will look like. The view on top is approaching from the bus loop on the south entrance. Uh, we're about halfway into the driveway looking at the building from the west. Uh, the building steps up from a first floor or a single floor massing with the administration and the music room in the cafeteria. And it steps up to a three-story classroom wing beyond. The view on the bottom half of the page is looking from the north um, at the, as you would be leaving in the parent drop-off drive, looking at the building, and you can see the three-story classroom behind the library and cafeteria. Just some closer views there. As you're getting closer to the building here, you'd be at the beginning of the van drop-off, which is off of the bus drop-off loop to the south. This is the main entrance, which is in this particular view, obscured by some plantings, um, the gym, and then there's a second entrance to the building to the south, another building of the 
view of the building from the north. That is, uh, those are the plans and the uh, views of the building. Um, I don't know how much else you would like to get into, but we have um, utility plans, we have lighting plans. Um, um, we can also open up to questions. Um, I don't know how you would like to proceed. That is the overall of the of the project and, and the benefits that we see from it. Okay. Thank you, Tim. I'm sure we'll come up with a few questions for you to show us a little, sure little more of the design before we're done. All right, so um, I guess you you mentioned uh, the solar panels going 15 feet, going into the 30 foot required setback. Um, and I didn't remember hearing that before. Uh, Chris, do we have a complete list of the waivers? Um, that particular item is not a waiver. It's a special permit, and um, it is mentioned a couple of times, I think. One is on page two of the development application report, um, where the side setback is mentioned, and the side setback normally in this district is 15 feet, but because this is an educational use, the um, setback needs to be 30 feet. And the um, setback for the solar canopy that's proposed appears to me to be five feet in one location and 10 feet, well, five feet for the canopy and 10 feet for the post. Now, it is possible to um, to have a special permit to modify that setback requirement. And um, at the bottom of page two is a description of the footnote A special permit that the applicant may choose to take advantage of. Um, so the applicant has a couple of different um, choices here. The applicant could pull back from the property line <clears throat> 30 feet and then meet the um, zoning dimensional requirements or the applicant could uh, apply for a special permit to modify that setback requirement and then choose what, you know, how much he wants to modify it. Um, and I, it's kind of a trade-off between having more solar canopy available um, or less solar canopy available. And so you may choose to grant the special permit um, for this modification in order to allow the school to have more um, solar panels. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess uh, I had missed that on the development application report. Thanks for pointing that out. This, um, um, they have not yet applied for this particular special permit. So it, it is a special permit that they need to apply for um, going forward. Okay. And it's a planning board special permit. So did right. you want me to list all the special permits that they need? Well, I think it's going to be useful to have them all in one place. Yeah. All in one place. Um, okay. I, you know, I mean. Sure, I, I, I can. I guess, I, can I guess that just seems to me like a good place to start is, uh, uh, you know, at least to, to be clear about what what explicit permission we need to give. Well, I can um, talk about it now, and then I can provide you with a document after this public hearing session uh, is continued, um, if you choose to continue it. So um, the first special permit that they need is to modify the height of the building. Um, the height of the building is um, allowed to be 35 feet in the RVC zoning district. So everything to the left of that red line is in the RVC zoning district. Um, so uh, what they're proposing is a 43 foot high building and 35 feet is allowed in the RVC zoning district. So that's one special permit that they are asking for from the planning board. The other special permit that they're asking for so far from the planning board is to allow the filling of land under section 5.10 of the zoning bylaw. And that limits um, the filling of land either 
two feet over 5,000 square feet or five feet over 2,000 square feet. And they're going beyond that because of the filling that they need for the athletic area as well as for the um, building. So they will need a special permit from the planning board to do that. So, so what I'm saying is really along with the site plan review, they need a special permit for the height of the building and they need a special permit for filling of land. And that's embedded in this um, report, but perhaps it's not clearly um, well, those those two items were in the introduction, yep. you know, and in the advertisement for this hearing. So that's correct. Yeah, it was just the third one that made me surprised that that hadn't the, been mentioned yet. The canopy, so, yeah, I think that was uh, in the revised um, development application report, which I just sent out yesterday. Yeah, I had sent one out previous to that, and then I sent a revised one out yesterday. Right. So there's another special permit that um, the applicant needs for uh, a special permit to locate two structures in the FPC zoning district. And one of the structures is what Tim pointed out, the east end of the building, of the main building, is um, lies within the FPC zoning district. And the FPC zoning district is not the same as the 100-year floodplain, so there's no compensatory storage required but there is a requirement of the zoning bylaw to have a special permit to locate um, a structure in the FPC zoning district. So that's, there's that portion of the main building, and then there's a little outdoor learning structure, and um, that is <clears throat> shown right there, yes, and that's a little, I think it's an open-sided structure with a roof and, and pillars. Um, so that's another... It's an accessory structure that will be located in the FPC zoning district. So they need the special permit for that. And then <clears throat> what we real I realized um, kind of late in the day was that um, they also need a footnote A special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that that special permit to locate a structure in the FPC zoning district is a Zoning Board of Appeals special permit. So the planning board needs to know about it and acknowledge it, but doesn't need to act on it. Um, and as part of that um, special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, the applicant will need to get permission under footnote A um, to locate a structure that's taller than one floor because the limitation on a structure is only one floor in the FPC zoning district. And it is also over 20 feet in height, so they'll need a special permit from the uh, ZBA for the structure that's over 20 feet in height. And I spoke with the building commissioner, and he felt that the um, the legal ad that has been published for the special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, can cover those three items, locating structures within the FPC zoning district, um, having a building that's more than one floor, and that would be a footnote A special permit, and then having a building that's taller than 20 feet, and that would also be um, a footnote A special permit. He thought those could all be encompassed in the Zoning Board of Appeals review, which was originally scheduled for January 25th. I had made a mistake in the development application report, and I think I said it was going to be February 8th, but it's actually January 25th that the advertisement was for, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals may not uh, be able to have a quorum on that day or that night. So um, our staff person, Rob Wachilla, who staffs the Zoning Board, is um, trying to see if he can have a quorum for that day. But if not, it would probably be sometime in early February that this would be heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So I think that is the extent of the special permits, um, which would be, I guess, in the end, it would be three from the planning board. It would be um, a special permit for the height, a special permit for filling, and a special permit for side setback for the um, for this uh, solar canopy. The one that you have not received yet is the side setback for the solar canopy. So. Um, Mr. Cooper will be um, submitting that unless the applicant decides to pull back and not um, not put the solar canopy so close to the property line. 
So I think okay. that's I think that's it. Thank you for running through all that, Chris. Mm -hmm. That is helpful to hear it. Uh, Janet, I have seen your hand for a while, and I'm now ready to call on you. Thank you. Um, Chris, I got a little confused on buildings and structures. Can you uh, say which is the ZBA structure? Like, what are the special, what structures for the, the ZBA has to approve? I, I kind of was writing my notes. It was the, the school building and the, the shade structure for the outdoor classroom. Oh, so it's the building itself. Okay, thank you. It's part of the building. It's only about maybe a quarter to a third of the eastern end of the building that's going to be located in the FPC zoning district. So that's the part that needs the special permit. And then that little outdoor classroom needs a special permit. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, all right. So actually, I'm going to ask Bruce a question since you've attended most of this the school uh, building committee meetings over the last many years. Um, was, do you think in the site selection, it was understood that all these special, that these permits would be required? Um, bearing in mind that I was not a member of the committee, I just witnessed yes. and so forth, and I probably didn't get all of the packages and so forth. Um, but I would guess that at this level of granularity, the answer would be no um, uh, in terms of very sp specifics, because of course we hadn't designed the building then. So for example, the, the, uh, the array, one would not have any idea that we would need that. As far as FPC instances, I'm not sure it's possible, but I don't, I don't recall that being discussed, but actually Tim was, Tim was, uh, it would have been involved in uh, more extensive discussions than uh, things that didn't happen in the meeting, for example, which probably represents the greater part of his time on the project, yeah. probably, definitely. Can, so can I respond okay. to that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Tim. Sure. Um, so we have known uh, from the very beginning um, about uh, the flood prone conservancy and the issues of the floodplain and the setbacks from the Fort River and the Faring Brook on the site. That being said, we did not know that all of the permits listed, uh, certainly not the, and I, I guess if we had read everything, we, we, we did not know about all these permits, not for the PV. So the PV location was not determined when we chose the site. Uh, the, it centered up where it has so that it can be operational on day one. I mean, you'll see a, a large open parking lot just north of where the PV is located, which is honestly a perfect location, except it's not available until the existing building is taken down. And so to comply with the net zero bylaw, you have to have your energy production systems, your high efficiency seating system operating when the building is operating. Uh, so that is why it is pushed to where it is. Um, you could push it further onto the grass, but it's, uh, in our view, not a good design decision to put uh, opaque PV canopies over where we want something to grow. Uh, so, um, you know, once we've considered the many facets of the project, that PV canopy got pushed into that location. That is why it is there. So I, I will say that one was not known when the site was selected. We did know that we would be coming before you and the ZBA when the site was selected, uh, but we didn't know at this level of granularity, to use your words, uh, which I think are good, what we would be applying for. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking more of the fill and the height, um, but that's fine. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Okay, Bruce, uh, is your hand still up? Yes, it is. Uh, definitely the fill. That was a, a very big uh, uh, recognition in site selection that there would be a cost associated uh, with this site over Wildwood. But that, the reason I had my hand up was uh, um, if I could uh, imagine the intent of the uh, bylaw that uh, doubles the distance for a school, for setbacks and so forth, it would not be that uh, it would be trying to push solar arrays back, I would think, which is probably way before anybody thought that there would be solar arrays associated with schools independent of the building. Um, so I would guess that uh, we would be, I would be comfortable in uh, supporting this, uh, this uh, um, 
uh, this this particular aspect of a permit special permit application because it's not really the uh, educational facility uh, the, the 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 educational spaces and all of the activity associated with that with humans involved that is impinging in the setback uh, that is way way back and it's really only a mechanical device that's on the setback and uh, my guess is that uh, uh, that we could uh, reasonably uh, uh, agree to do this without creating the kind of uh, precedent that might embarrass others. All right. Well, I, I mean, you know, this is a solar array immediately adjacent to a residential property. And I can imagine us having other solar arrays adjacent to residential properties with neighbors who are looking for much greater setbacks from their land. Um, so, you know, so maybe I'm arguing that it should only be 15 if we have a, a rather than 30, but uh, right. under the circumstances, I'll, uh, I understand what Tim's saying and I basically support it right. and have done for quite a while. Okay. Janet. So um, do you, are we going to discuss this particular special permit right now or do you want to like pull back the lens and get the whole overview? Because I do have a bunch of ideas for this um this particular issue, but I'm not sure should we talk about it now? So yeah, I I, I really kind of just wanted to get a, a overall picture of the permits that we were going to discuss. No, I thought um, that was a great thing because I didn't I hadn't tracked it at all. I mean I did yeah yeah and, and, and now the, that now that we have that um if there if you want to sort of pull back uh I'm happy to do that. I think that would be a good thing. Okay. Um, and so let's kind of head in that direction and chris you wanted to say something i wanted to say that you haven't yet received the application for the special permit for the solar array so i think it makes sense to put off that discussion thanks right okay all right and um so so we have two sort of main overall overarching uh charges before us one is the site plan review and the other is this, these particular, the two special permits that have been applied for. And so maybe, I, it seems to me, maybe we should start with the site plan review. Does that, anybody object to that? Um, so I guess as I read through the uh, material that we were sent, uh, you know, I felt like the traffic and the water management were probably the biggest issues for me. Um, and so I'm gonna wanna ask a few questions about that. And so, um, Johanna, I guess I'm, I'm kind of opening up the floor for general questions about the site. Thanks, I was mostly hoping we could get a, re a report back from the site plan or from the site visit that happened today. Oh yes, thank you for reminding me. Of course. Yeah, I think was it was it Bruce and uh, Janet who made it out there and managed to get back. Um, so, do either of you want to give us a recap of of what you heard and saw? I, I thought the, Janet would be the one because uh, she's got the fresh eyes. I have fresh eyes, and then Bruce has detailed eyes, and Chris was there also. So I think we could do it as a group effort. Um, so we basically went to the site um, and we, you know, um, Mr. Cooper showed us where the door was, the front door, and it's kind of in the parking lot, the side parking lot. Um, I wanted sort of a big view of the th site because I mean, I've been there a million times. There's, there's a rip, Fort River is behind it to the right or the south of it is Fearing Brook. Um, and then there's a chain link fence keeping all the students in. Um, on the north side of the site, there's a small wetland. And I think there's another floating wetland somewhere else. There, um, it's a wetland that my children have disappeared into and never been seen again. So apparently it's cut, but not then. Um, we basically, um, in the par the parking lot on the side, which is now used for you know um, parents to drop off their kids, there's a whole collection of pine trees, white pine trees that will come down because the building will be there. They seem happy, but they're just completely in the way. Um, the pavement of the parking lot and the roadways will be, you know, standard asphalt pa pavement. I had asked about whether there was like a curbing in the main parking lot 
to the west of the building if there's going to be a kind of a break between all these lines of cars because I thought that per I had wonder wonder about the safety of that with terms of kids running with so many lanes of traffic. Um, I we questions were asked about why there's not um, the entire parking lot is not covered with solar panels and you know which because this this the Fort River site is actually identified as a place that we could have large scale solar. And the answer um, was that they could extend the panels, but the purpose of this project was to build a net zero elementary school and stay within their budgets. And so while the, the um, canopies could be extended, they really just stopped where they had to stop. Um, um, but there, you know, there's a possibility it could be extended. They also, wanted to make sure that, you know, they, when they turned the lights on the first day, that um, everything was, it was a net zero building from day one um, and not day, you know, three months later or whatever. Um, what else did we talk about? Um, we talked about, you know, the different landscaping, um, like the, around the school, there's different play areas and there's the, the student um, outdoor classroom. Um, closer to the trees, there's kind of a natural forest floor um, you know, place with a lot of trees that the kids can do sort of creative play. And then also there's a whole no mow grass area to the south, which I became obsessed with ticks because I'm obsessed with ticks. But apparently that's going to be like a pollinator area, meadow, um, part of the educational component and tying in with the organic garden and some other pollinator, pollinator friendly um, plantings. Um, I don't know how that will be handled in the future if the children do wind up with ticks. Um, I had questions about the stormwater management because it's, you know, it's a, it's a river, it's next to a river. And so um, Mr. Cooper showed us, um, and I think it might be good to pull up a map. There's like different places that water is held and kind of clean through a sand, sand kind of um, surface. Th this is out of my wheelhouse in terms of expertise. And so Mr. You know, Bruce, please help me. But um, there's like a culvert that goes north, south on the site, kind of, um, kind of where through the parking lot, as I recall, but right in front of um, the parking lot with all these different shrubs is kind of a sand filtration system, obviously underground. Uh, it will hold water until it's ready to go somewhere else. Um, there's another um, kind of rain garden in front of, I'm trying to think about the north side of the building. Um, and then there's all this underground infrastructure that he didn't go into huge detail with, but that I think they'll present later to us. So water will be filtered through grass, through rain, I mean, sand, rain gardens held until it's ready to go. And then it goes south, um, I guess, to these, I don't want to say culvert, but then eventually would be released into the Fearing Brook, clean and, and pleasant. Um, and then, the you know, we talked about the need to raise the site up to you know, avoid dampness. Um, what else? I'm trying to check my notes. Um, the athletic fields will be improved, and that they're they're gonna. There's like two phases to the project. The first one is to build um, the school and all the infrastructure around it. Um, move all the kids into the school. Phase two would be demolish the building and improve the all the athletic fields you see to the north. Um, I had wondered if it was enough space for so many kids to play, but they're going to do recess in several shifts and there'll be different playground equipment. I had asked if they're going to save the playground equipment because there's really four sets of equipment, two sets, which are actually fairly new. And I think, um, you know, Mr. Cooper said he, he thought it could be saved, but it would be expensive to save it. And it might, you know, some, the town official he had spoken to sort of recommended new equipment. Um, we had talked about the lighting and where the highest lighting would be, which is around the building. We talked about the timing of the lights. We talked about whether the current light poles that are around the softball field could be reused or like um, just cut down and, you know, re they're really sort of huge. Bruce had a lot to say about that. And I think that's most of, um, I had a question about where the priority habitat was. It's not in the grassy area. It's in the um, tree area. So it's not a natural, that whole area is not really in our purview or the priority ha habitat won't be affected. Um, 
And then we talked about the entrances and exits um, and that, you know, basically keeping the school buses and the kids discharging and getting off separate from parents and staff or parents picking up people, kids, um, is done kind of as a safety. You know, I think it's logistically easier, but I think also it's safer to keep kids out of that parking lot as much as possible. Bruce, do you have anything to add? I uh, was tracking you on Chris's uh, um, notes that she issued a, a moment ago, and uh, you hit every base that she hit, plus a couple of your own. So no, I don't. We also talked about um, there's a crossing guard now at the north exit, and whether a one might be needed at the south if kids are coming across the street from the west, particularly if when the East Street School is developed into like a fairly large housing situation, which I think is in the hopper. There is some low income housing behind there. And I do know kids come across and I, you know, ostensibly they should walk up to the intersection, wait for the lights and then cross. And that intersection is like the slowest intersection waiting light situation. <laughs> and so I, I wondered if kids would just wanna cut across from the common and just get to school. And so I don't know if that could be a permit condition later if it turns out to be a problem, but I do think that's a kind of a possible stick, you know, a danger or safety issue. Okay, thank you, Janet. That was, that was extensive. And um, it's a group thank, effort. <laughs> thank you and Bruce and Chris for going. Chris, anything you wanted to add? Okay. That covers it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Doug, if I may. Yes. Um, uh, one of the things we didn't do, which I had on my list but forgot to, was I, I wanted to look at the uh, mural. Uh, and I wanted to look at that because the design review board's single condition, really, or one of two, was uh, that we should seek to uh, retain that mural. And I confess I can't remember seeing it. So perhaps I could ask, uh, I don't know, Tim, whether you're familiar with that mural uh, or... Um, anybody who might be. Is that a mural that's already outside or is it an inside mural? Uh, what are we dealing with here? Uh, it is an exterior mural, um, which is essentially painted plywood fastened to the exterior of the building. Um, so if it were to be saved, it would probably be in an interior condition because it's not um, built, constructed, fabricated in a way that would uh, last the lifetime of a generational building. But um, uh, on other projects, we've also scanned, photographed, if you will, and reprinted artwork on other media. Uh, so that is something we could look at. And have, have you got any plans to incorporate it at this point? We have identified areas in the building and we have continuing meetings with the subcommittee that's designing the building to uh, finalize the locations for them. But uh, an exact location and an exact extent of the existing mural, no, we do not have that at this point. But you have a, a definite plan to either reinstall it or replicate it somewhere in the building? We, no, uh, to be clear, we have identified areas in the building that could be used to host art, what that art will be, whether it's that mural or some other art that is commissioned or drawn from somewhere in the district has not been decided. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Are there general questions from the board that we should entertain at the moment? I, I'm, I'm also thinking that it might be useful to have your civil engineer go through the water management plans and have yeah, your have your traffic engineer talk about the traffic mitigation to the extent that we haven't heard of everything about it so far. Um, so you, those guys can kind of get ready. Um, yeah. Johanna, I see your hand. Thank you. Um, as part of the traffic mitigation plan, I would love to hear more about what the vision is for cyclists to enter the site, park bikes on the site, and exit the site. 
Okay. Um, should starting with civil can uh, Steve or Janet, if you're here, um, do you want me to share a plan or do you have a plan that you can share to give an overview of the stormwater management system? Uh, yeah, I can give an overview. If you have a plan to share, that would be helpful. Sure. So our general stormwater management plan consists of uh, a bunch of different tools from our toolbox to try to uh, manage the stormwater on the site. Um, some of these pieces include water quality units, deep sump catch basins, sand filters, rain gardens, uh, bar retention gar gardens, as well as um, a grass swale. Um, we're using each of these on different parts of the site, varying uh, because the site is varying in different types of soil as well as different depths of groundwater. Um, I can, I guess, I can go uh, along the site from. Uh, top to bottom and left to right. So where this cursor is now, just below that, if you're looking at the northern parking lot, there is one of two sand filters. Um, what this is, is a shallow uh, shallow intake area that has a few different um, water quality units um, that are taking in, taking in water that are draining to this area for the parking lot. Um, this is uh, lined and has an under drain to it, this upper sand filter connects to second sand filter where the cursor is now. Um, that's also taking the southern portion of that parking lot. These two sand filters are connected and have multiple outlets that eventually drain to the double culvert that runs through the western end of <clears throat> western end of the site um, and out to Fearing Brook. Um, it connects. To the northern portion of the site where there is a wetland located uh, as it's conveyed through the site and as you know that brook ends up going to the fort river the point of these um, water quality units as well as um, these sand filters are to help with uh, treatment of uh, stormwater that's running off a parking lot and that's um, generally on site as well as help detain some of the water on site so we are meeting our peak runoff rate uh, that it is uh, matching the existing condition. Um, that is the major staff and um, uh, parent parking lot area. As you go to the southern portion of the site, the bus uh, bus and service drop-off area, there's a bioretention located there that is handling the majority of the stormwater that is coming from the paved area around in that section. Um, it is being treated in a slight depressional area there, and that also has an underdrain to it and drains and connects to that culvert, that double culvert as well, um, that runs underneath um, the smaller of the two islands um, in that <clears throat> bus service drop-off area and then out to Faring Brook. Another uh, stormwater control measure that we have is a rain garden that is near these basketball courts. It's taking uh, surface level runoff from the uh, multiple play areas and uh, uh, withholding some of the water and treating it within this area. This water eventually overflows to the other side of these um, walking paths area, walking path areas, as where you're seeing the cursor now, um, and drains to uh, the Fort River. There are some smaller. Um, stormwater control measures that include stone trenches that help reduce some of the debris or anything that's coming off of um, each of these playground areas that are surrounding these uh, basketball courts that are helping with some of the sediment removal prior to getting to these um, these larger uh, this larger spring garden area. In addition to these stormwater control measures that are typical, for cleaning water, there's also uh, one or two locations where we're also ha we have subsurface infrastructure that is helping detain water, which includes the athletic field as well as this playground area. Each of these are designed with a subsurface stone reservoir to help with draining of these um, facilities, but it also helps with delaying the timing of that runoff from these facilities. Uh, both of these, both this playground area and this athletic field 
uh, drained via under drain pipe uh, underneath this uh, walk that you're seeing that's running north south to the east of the athletic field and end up draining to the Fort River as well. Okay, are you that's 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 it? There, I mean, I'm I, I'd like to pause if you have any questions of what I've explained so far. I can okay go into uh, detail. Does anybody where... have any questions at the moment? Janet. This is a little throwback to the site plan report. Um, the question had sort of come up for me um, reading the conservation before they did the NOI of who's going to maintain this system. And so it turns out um, talking through with DPW and the school maintenance staff, the school will be on a, a like a calendar for inspecting um, to see if you know drains need to be cleaned out. And then if they do, then DPW will do that work. And I think that is in the um, con concoms permit. And it might be an idea for us to put it in our permit. So it's just the idea of a maintenance schedule and who does what is in people's minds. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I forgot my second point. I'll, I'll have to remember. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. To touch upon that, that is correct. There uh, has been an agreement between the uh, Department of Public Works as well as the school for uh, the different pieces of the operation and maintenance of these different control measures throughout the site. Um, uh, they, there is an understanding of who does what and when. Um, we have provided an operation and maintenance manual uh, detailing what is needed for each of these different control measures. Um, it, so the, uh, to my understanding, the, the level of maintenance for the school is uh, typical uh, mowing and weeding is needed, as well as picking up general debris in each of these, whereas the Department of Public Works is typically looking at um, cleaning out catch basins uh, as needed um, or at doing anything that requires um, mechanical sweeping or uh, generative vac uh, vacuuming. Um, for different uh, control measures. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Um, given the uh, history of uh, um, moisture water problems associated with the school building itself and the interior spaces of the uh, present Fort River building, I think it's important that uh, we ask uh, um, with regard to the building itself, the footprint, uh, um, I notice in the drawings there are what I might call conventional footing drains and probably some uh, under slab uh, gravel. Uh, the building has been lifted two feet. Uh, you've told us. Uh, are there, is there any uh, beyond that? Is there any special um, drainage uh, provisions to ensure that this building doesn't have a a ghost of a chance in hell of uh, being uh, beset by anything similar to the problems that the old school has had to deal with for the whole of its life. So we have that typical foundation drain that's in here that should be tying into our uh, roof train runoff that's leading away from the school. Um, beyond that, I would defer to uh, Tim or Rick that may be able to answer that question. Yeah. Okay. All right. I see Rick's hand. I just uh, want to clarify that we have under slab um, drainage, uh, so it's it's not a typical footing drain. If if that does exist on a drawing in some old set, that that is uh, oh, sorry. Uh, but but that will connect to the uh, roof drainage system, and that will eventually. But uh, just to respond to Bruce's point, yes, we are lifting it up. We are breaking capillary action with a porous fill. We are doing drainage layer, um, um, all of which is a belt and suspenders system for um, making it nearly impossible for water to travel upward. Okay, Bruce, uh, any other questions? Sorry, no, it's a legacy. I've got many other questions, but... They'll be coming in time. Okay. And Rick, I still see your yeah. hands. You want to add I, to that? I, I was going to add that uh, the 
new building in its new location finished floor elevation is higher than the existing building's finished floor elevation. So we're pulling it up out of the natural uh, groundwater elevation. And we're also raising the elevation of the athletic fields to similarly pull that up uh, out of the, get it higher and then have gravity drains, uh, as Steve mentioned, draining that off uh, toward the riverfront. Okay, thank you. Johanna. Thank you. Um, and now might not be the time in which case put me in my place, but um, the direct drainage of the fields into the river just made me wonder what the management plan was for the fields and whether that management plan included application of fertilizer and pesticides, and if so, what was being done to reduce impacts on the river. Okay. Um, Tim, anybody want to? Oh, I, Janet, I see your hand. Janet. Yeah, um, just for the record, Janet Bernardo with the Horse and Witten Group. Um, the operation and maintenance plan that we have put together and we have discussed with the school department as well as the DPW includes um, the types of fertilizers and pesticides that could be placed on that field and the idea of minimizing it to the greatest extent possible. The Basically, the underdrain system water will fall on the grass, work its way through the material, and then get into an underdrain. So it takes some time to get to those pipes. And then it's a whole like um, fanned hexagon kind of uh, system that eventually brings it all the way to one, well, there's three actual outlets along that path. And the wooded area is still like greater than 200 feet from the river. It's a, like the wooded area that's there is, um, that's the habitat that you, I think were mentioning. Um, there's a good long distance. So we have had the discussion and it is in the O&M plan um, for this athletic field. And I, I, I recall noticing in the uh, communication from the Conservation Commission that there was also some conditions around fertilizer in their order as well, correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. Thank you. Uh, Johanna, any other questions before we go to Janet? Okay, Janet. So, you know, I, I hear all these details of the stormwater management. I understand it conceptually. I have no way of really analyzing it. And so I'm hoping that the town engineer is going to take a look at it and give us the AOK -okay or make recommendations before we um, sign a permit. So is Chris, do you think that we'll get something from Jason Skills hopefully soon? Or Chris? Yes, we uh, we sent the transmittal to Jason and we reminded him a couple of times. Um, so I'm hoping that we will get a response from him. Um, but um, the um, Aaron Jacques, the wetlands administrator, has reviewed all of this for the Conservation Commission. And she's very knowledgeable about um, drainage systems. So I would say that her review is um, probably equal to what Jason would do. Um, but we will still keep asking Jason for his review. OK. Janet, anything else? No. OK. No, thank you. All right. Um, so I guess I had a question. You know, I've, I see, or I you, you've described these sand filters uh, swales, rain gardens, all, all of which I assume rely on gravity to move water down. And I guess my question is, are any of these uh, items below the level of the, of the water table? And, you know, I, I guess there have been repeated references in some of this material and previously to the high water table of this area. I understand you're raising the building, 
And I now understand you're raising some of the athletic fields, but uh, is are the so I guess are the invert elevations of the of these uh, control mechanisms high enough to be out of the water table? So we, where we are planning, uh, Janet, do you want to answer this one? No, you got it. Okay. So where we are planning uh, some of these control measures that um, uh, we're determining whether or not they're above that water table. Um, some of these control measures will be lined with a liner um, to prevent any intrusion of that groundwater table. But for the most part, when, uh, when we have done our uh, uh, test pits in each of these areas. Um, we're taking into consideration what kind of control measures we're actually going to use. So they're uh, a bit shallower than your typical stormwater control measures that you'd see uh, on a regular site that don't have groundwater issues. Um, a lot of these were built in, uh, designed in a way that we're staying really close to the surface and we don't have a lot of depth to play with. So we're staying uh, out of that uh, ground, uh, typical groundwater that you'd see on site. So anything to add, Janet? Yeah, I, I'm just going to add that there, as you know, we mentioned, there is that large twin culvert that crosses through the site and that became our control. So the inverts of our final invert needed to hit the, like the top the top of our pipes need to hit the top of that culvert was the goal so that it would be above above the bottom of the culvert. It's a 44 by 27? 20, correct. 27. And so if we have a 12 inch pipe coming in it, it's coming in at the top. So it has um, that separation from the bottom of the culvert. So that was kind of our goal is to keep that culvert as our controlling inverts. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions on water at the moment? All right. Um, Tim, uh, is there somebody from your team that should go through the traffic conversation? Uh, we have David Loring here. I will uh, just preempt his comments to saying that, um, you know, in discussions with the town, our purview sort of ends at the property line, but, uh, and off traffic stuff uh, we've discussed, but is, is not part of the project. So uh, with that, I'll let David talk about what we have done on site. Um. Rick, I see your hand. Yeah. Should, uh, you want to say something before? I wanted to say about the uh, not just leave Tim's statement that uh, our work stopped at the property line. The town has retained uh, a different consultant to look at traffic control measures related from the project offsite, and that report is due to them in February. And I got that information uh, from from Paul Bachelman through okay. the OPM. Great, thank you, um, Mr. Um, yes. Yes, Marshall. Sir. Do you want to take a break? Oh, that's a good point. It is eight o'clock. Um, sure, why not? Um, I guess I will mention. Uh, that I was thinking if we if we it doesn't seem like we're going to get anywhere close to finish tonight that maybe we target something like 930 for trying to finish get to a stopping point. And um, so I just want to plant that seed. Um, however, yes, we usually take a five minute break right around eight o'clock. So my clock is showing 806. Uh, feel free to take a break and turn off your camera, mute your uh, microphone, and turn on your camera at least when you come back at 8.11, so five minutes from now. Thank you.
I don't need one at the moment. Thank you. Doug, I'm back, but I'm going to keep my camera off for a few minutes, but I'll be listening. I'm sorry, Jesse. S nope. Could you say that again? I'm back. I'm just going to keep my camera off for a few minutes. Okay. But I'm still here. Rick, can I assume that your hand is a legacy hand? Yes, it is. I, I'll take it down now. Thank you. Okay. And uh, before we before we get to David, I wanted to ask one more question that I have, was having trouble remembering before the break about the water. Just wait for everybody to get back.
I love Jesse Nature's screensaver. It's so beautiful. I suspect that's some of the biological material he works with. That's right. Yeah. I wonder Johanna, what this... Johanna, if you're there, please come on back. I wonder what Jesse's scale is. Is it uh, microbial or is it galactic? I just, I think it's probably microbial. It's it's an it's an embryo implanting in the uterus. If you have to know. Oh. It looks like a carabiner. I hate to ask, which is what? <laughs> <laughs> the, the red oval shape is the it's a mouse uterus and then the inside of that is a very early mouse embryo making contact good heavens so but, cold that's what i do for work later <laughs> okay we've got we've got johanna back so we've got our our board representation uh before we get to the traffic i just wanted to ask one question of either Janet or Steve, I think it was. Um, is it my, am I understanding our conservation regulations correctly that you, since this is an existing site with an existing building, it's considered developed and therefore you only need to treat or maybe control, control or hold or filters whatever verb we need to use, more of the, of the stormwater than is existing, is currently being controlled. Is that true? The stormwater management handbook that is um, from the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, they, they uh, have specific standards that we need to go by and we need to match uh, well, we cannot increase post-development stormwater runoff over pre-development stormwater runoff. So if it was a wooded site, we might have to do a lot more than we have to do because it was an existing school, but we are um, reducing our peak flow under our proposed conditions from what is currently flowing towards the Fort River. So this, so the devices that you're using are containing water and holding it so that the peak flow is lower. Correct. Uh, okay. And because of groundwater, usually you would um, want to infiltrate as much as possible, but because groundwater is high, we couldn't infiltrate as much as we typically want to and like to, we are proposing infiltration under like the athletic fields and the playground and, and in the rain garden. So we have some areas that are particularly shallow uh, stormwater features. The uh, sand filters are a little deeper so that they can hold back some of the water. Okay. And, and one other question prompted by you saying you have very shallow features. Um, particularly on the, the play fields. Uh, if I want to set a, a baseball base and it had, you know, how, how close to the surface is, are your uh, infiltration pipes? You know, if I need to put a stake in the ground to oh. hold, hold a uh, volleyball field, a uh, volleyball net, or. You know, They're actually two feet down. Yeah, I was going to say, Bill Brown actually did that design. They are two feet down. So we yes. so there's 24 inches of cover over everything at yep. a minimum. Yes, it's the um like the rain garden that is behind the basketball courts. That is more. It's kind of a landscaping feature. It will have plants in it that help um provide water quality for the runoff that's coming into it. So it will, you may not even understand that it is a, actually happening for stormwater management because it will look like a garden. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else think of any water questions while you were taking a break? <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Loring, I think you're on. Why don't you talk to us about the traffic control within the site? 
Okay. Well, Power Prepared at David Loring Power Corporation. We were the traffic consultant for Denisco for this project. The, the main goal of our project, we prepared a traffic impact analysis, which I believe has been submitted to the planning board in uh, May of 2022 that reviewed both the Wildwood and the Fort River sites, doing a complete traffic analysis and study um, for those two sites. Now, as we turn attention specifically to Fort River, we were involved with both looking at the on and off site at the conceptual level when we did that traffic impact analysis. Um, so we've got the two separations, as you've seen, come up with the bike or the uh, bus and the drop-off loop, designing that to accommodate the buses and drop-off procedures, looking at queuing based on the information provided from the school department for the number of buses um, and vans that will be used for the drop-off, then confirming the geometric movements to allow that geometric shape, making sure that we could put dual bus lanes through there and accommodate it with the geometry. Um, that also has the bike and pedestrian walkways associated where they'll come in off of Southeast Street and cross and then enter through likely the main entrance of the school. The Northern section that Tim alluded to earlier includes three lanes, one lane in, two lanes out. Traffic is intended to come in from the drop-off, parent drop-off loop through the parking lot and then would queue up along the east lanes that um, head in a north-south orientation. Um, within the parking lot itself, we included raised crosswalks or a raised table, if you will, to ensure that speed would be controlled through that parking lot for the protection and safety of both all users, kids, and uh, you know people traversing back and forth through the parking lot. Um, there's, we added signage that are shown in the signage plan. Um, a lot of the impacts are, are offsite and we did provide conceptual level of improvements, our opinions on what could be done to at least alleviate some of the traffic concerns for this site. I don't know how much more I can say or you want to hear, but um, as Tim touched on the overall patterns earlier, um, but I can be glad to elaborate further on any specifics with regards to the traffic and the layout that's there. All right, thank you. I guess I'll, I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna just start off with a question. Um, you talk about the, the I'm gonna call it the student drop-off because we're dropping off students um, along the east side of the parking lot. And if I'm dropping off a student, I'm gonna wanna do it at the south end, right? Because that's where the front door is when it's raining cats and dogs. Um, so how are we going to keep people from stopping at that southeast corner and queuing up behind that? And how are we going to get them to actually use the entire east side for drop off? Without speaking out of turn, I think I may have to rely on some of the Denisco staff as well. But the parking, as we have viewed the site you know, in its existing conditions, the staff and faculty um, play a large role in managing traffic on the site. And I are expecting that they will continue to do so, so that as parents come in, they'll be encouraged to go to the head of the line, if you will, and queue up behind them to form that queue along that bay. Okay. In our discussions with uh, staff <laughs> at the school, it is understood that there will continue to be staff controlling functions. Um, we have made at least one accommodation that there is a pull off at the south end here, which is a sort of flush curb with area for four cars for um, a noted need of students that require additional time uh, need to be settled before they brought into the building, uh, which could potentially clog the queue. So there is an extra accommodation made here at the south. But, you know, as you allude to, uh, parents have to participate and park and, and cooperate and they don't always model the best behavior, but um, we have given them the opportunity to do that. Okay. Do. And am I correct that if I don't want to go all the way to the south end, I can cut off the loop by going along your tabled 
east-west connection there that's north of the uh, solar panels? Uh, David, so we'll, to the extent during drop-off hours, we were not going to, the staff is not going to allow, uh, currently cars are guided through the parking lot with cones. I would imagine uh, that will be blocked off in a similar fashion during peak drop-off and pickup areas, times I should say. Um, it, it, part of the reason that that is there is partially to slow traffic, as David mentioned, but also there is a community asset here that doesn't require the entire parking lot. So there's that shortcut there. Um, it's designed for flexibility, but we certainly have safety as the highest priority and, and those sort of shortcuts, the dropping off in the parking lot, we can't prevent it, but we will do everything to discourage it. Okay. Uh, Johanna. Thanks. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but would you be able to just trace with a cursor, like if you are a parent in the morning driving your kid to school, what is the route that they take? Yeah, Tim, some coming in the north entrance, turning right, going into the west lane, coming all the way down and following the outside loop. So the right lane within the parking lot is not part of the loop, but traveling south in this lane and then traveling north in a drive aisle only, which is two lanes wide for the entire extent. So I was gonna jump in, this is Nate. I, I, I really echo Doug's point about queuing and parents. <laughs> I don't understand um, you know, especially in inclement weather, why someone would drive another 200 feet beyond the drop off to drop their kids off there and not, you know, at the entrance when they're there. And so I think it's going to be confusing. And um, I don't know, you know, if you couldn't route traffic the other way. Uh, so um, I just think that that's, that'll be a, you know, a management issue that I mean, you know, to have staff, have, you, know, you might need multiple staff out there that are just constantly waving cars along seems you know, to a burden to put on the, on staff, you know, to when it could be that it functions differently. I think in the mornings, you generally have people coming in and just dropping off. So it's not so much an issue in the morning with queuing up. It's the queuing up in the afternoon for the pickup where we're lining the parents up to, to pick up their child in the afternoon. And mm -hmm. the other reason for not reversing the flow there is we get into crossing of traffic patterns with people trying to get in and out. You're crossing traffic. So we were trying to avoid that as well. So by providing the queuing on site, we're getting motor vehicles and parents off of Southeast Street and onto the site, and then they would queue up. So it, it really becomes the afternoon situation where we're looking to park the cars and allow parents to pick up their students as opposed to the morning where it's typically a quick drop off and they're out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jesse, you're the next hand I see. Great, thanks. Um, I was just going to reiterate Johanna's question from earlier. Is there an intentional uh, design for bikers? How will they flow into the traffic pattern? And where is there, are there bike racks involved somewhere? Uh, there are bike racks, Bill. I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about the location of the bike racks. There are two here um, and here. So what we've done to accommodate the bicycles is at the north and south entrances, there are sidewalks that come in off the street uh, that are 10 feet wide that accommodate walkers and bicyclists. And on the south entrance, as they come in, they follow um, the entrance drive, and then they cross the road. At that point, they'll need to get off their bicycle, and they'll cross the road, and then make their way to the front entrance, and there's bike racks right to the left in that location. And then if you're coming from the north, you're coming in north of the entrance drive. That's a 10 foot wide sidewalk for bikers and for people walking. They continue down. And then there's bike racks that are right to the left of playground, right in that location. All right. Jesse, any other questions? OK. Uh, on that subject, Art, is there any covered bicycle racks or provisions inside the building, like a shower for staff who might want a bicycle to work and show up and need a shower? 
there is not a shower in the building um, and the bicycle racks are not covered. Okay. Uh, Janet, you are next. Um, I wonder in that spot if you're coming in from the south where you the bikes have to cross to the to the um to the other sidewalk is if that could be sort of raised or kind of marked off in some way. I know there's just buses coming in, but you know, anytime you have little kids who are a little clueless in any kind of vehicle, it seems like anything that would slow that down would be something to alert the bus driver, like, oh, I'm gonna slow down, not that they're going that fast. So I just wonder if there's some way to put some lines there or raise like a table so it's like the vehicle knows they have to slow down um the other thing is is in terms of queuing like that's a problem at every school where if there's 40 parents trying to pick up a kid um at the same time there there are lines everywhere so I'm, i i appreciate the problem of queuing it's you know we have a bus system that will take you everywhere there's lots of kids who go to after school activities now and the parents are and guardians are driving them but I just, I don't know how you get around it when you have, you know, one exit or entrance to the building and 40 cars. And I think people who are driving just have to wait or park, go pick up their kid and walk back to their car. So that's a problem at Fort River now at half the size. I'm sure it's a problem at Wildwood um, and stuff. So I just think, you know, the more our parents are driving, the more they're sitting in lines, you know. All right. Uh Janet, I actually think think it's a little it's sort of exacerbated here because the drive does not go along the the length the the, the primary frontage of the building. You know, there's really just a very short moment where the drive is close to the building. So well, I think way... it's going to be worse than than Wildwood and probably Fort River. Well, the way Fort River operates now is you come in through the South Drive and you go into the side parking lot. You never go to the front of the building and um, you have to go around and there's a staff person sitting there waiting for you to get your kid out. And so there is this very strange kind of it's, you know, I think that one of the many principals at Fort River really wanted to separate the kids away from the buses and so instituted that as a safety thing. So there is a whole group of people waiting to pick up a kid or to drop a kid off at the side entrance. And there's a staff person there. Fort River has sort of a little side entrance that's in the front, but on the side. And so I just think the more people using their car, the more people waiting, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I know I'll never be in any of these lines. So, um, Johanna, you're next. Thank you. Um... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's possible that we just can't come up with an ideal here, but there, I guess I have, I just want to voice a couple of concerns. I think it is really not ideal to have the bicycles and pedestrians crossing the street where the buses come in. Um, I think we are trying as a town to encourage non-car traffic and so covered bike racks go a long way to making that happen um if folks from the design team haven't been at fort river for a morning drop off i encourage you to go and observe it sometime because basically they don't let kids they don't let parents drop off their kids until a certain time and so even in the morning there are often dozens of cars queued up you know, snaking around the south parking lot and into the driveway just to drop off their kid. Um, and, hang on, I had one more thing. Um, oh, I just need to find my notes. Um, and then I, I kind of, I'll admit it, I kind of hate the fact that the pedestrians and the cyclists are smushed together onto the same infrastructure. I feel like um, it, it it ends up like, I don't know, right? In regular society, cyclists are supposed to share the road with the cars and you're not supposed to ride your bike on the sidewalk. And I just think it like continues mixed messages in no man's land for cyclists when that's actually, I think a problem we have the opportunity to solve. 
those are my concerns. David, do you have any response to any of that? Most of the site design is fell under uh, others. We didn't get involved as much with the bike and pedestrian layout. So I think okay. certainly we can provide, you know, I, I will make a couple of comments as a traffic engineer looking at it. it it's difficult. We want to get the crossing, for example, on the bus loop, raising that. We I know we did discuss it and consider it. It is a managed entrance, if you will, that would be, that is intended to be signed for buses only. So we are talking about the buses and that type of a vehicle only, which should be intimately aware of the situation and setting that they're coming into. You can put a raised crosswalk there. It will add a further traffic calming device, but it's something that the buses are going to have to traverse over. So we can go either way with, with that, I guess. The actual bike and pedestrian layout and walkways, though, were designed um, by others on the Denisco team. Yeah, I, could like so to make I think they can probably better respond. Sure. Okay. Bill? Yeah, so I'd like to make a comment on the uh, on the on the path of travel on the southern end. We actually looked at putting the path uh, on the north side, but there are a lot of existing trees right very close to the curb that provide a nice buffer for that house. So that's why we kept the sidewalk on the southern side and are, are crossing the road. Uh, we could put um, a raised table on that location. If we did that, it would require us to install a catch basin at that location in order to um, mitigate the water that would back up in, in that location. Um, and then there's, you know, philosophically, how do we deal with cars and bicycles on site? And having younger kids potentially coming to the site, um, I would prefer personally to have them in a sidewalk situation than part of the road system, just because of the conflicts with bicycles and cars for younger people. Um, for adults, it's easier to manage, I think, but for children, it's much more difficult. All right. Uh, I guess on that subject, David, you made one comment that the bicyclists would need to dismount when they cross the road. Um, is that just good practice from a traffic engineering point of view, or is that something we actually need to expect children to do? I actually did not make that comment. I think oh. Tim did when he was explaining it. Sorry. But okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I think then maybe I, it was of no consequence. Bill. Somebody, I, I did not make that comment, but okay, sorry, never mind. Uh, Bruce. Um, a couple of things. Uh, um, uh, you should remember that we have a fairly substantial array of solar panels over uh, the parking in that end of the uh, the, the site. And uh, to your point, Doug, when it's raining uh, heavily, um, this is an unusual feature because we don't usually have sheltered parking. And uh, my guess is that uh, in the situations like that, people would make use of that in ways that you know we will have to we ha we can't yet fully predict. But I I think we should remember that we have this unusual feature, a rain sheltered uh, parking area. Um, I have a, a question related to the bikes as well. Um, I noticed that down in the uh, um, uh, south of the building uh, entry uh, there are. Uh, the bike locations there, I counted them. There are eight of them, as far as I can, and at least accommodation for eight bikes. And uh, I didn't notice or count the, the, the provisions to the north of the building, but uh, it's, uh, but nonetheless, when I counted those, I had uh, one assumption and one question. The, the, the assumption was that there's not very really many of them, and certainly they're not sheltered. It seems to me that there is a, a rather minimal expectation that anybody is going to ride. And, and I have kind of assumed that it would be staff that would ride and not uh, kids. But of course, kids may decide to ride. I don't know. The question is, what is the basis for determining the number of uh, uh, bicycle accommodation? I mean, I know we've, we've got uh, data on how you figured out the number of parking for cars. 
how did you figure out the number of uh, parking for bicycles? Because it seems to me to be remarkably small if I remember what my school looked like, uh, you know, 70 years ago or whenever it was. Um, there was actually um, eight bike racks south and nine bike racks north. Uh, they accommodate two bicycles each rack, so there's one on each side. Okay, so that's the number uh, so that's sixteen and and eighteen, whatever that is, um, uh, 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 thirty five or so. Um, uh, and we've got uh, two hundred and seventy five plus staff, so uh, we've probably got one to twenty, uh, more or less, in terms of humans that are coming and staying at the building. Um, I know some of those kids are so young that you would need extra wheels on the bike for them to be actual ride, but still, it's it's not many. Is there a you've so the answer is that we've got uh, uh, somewhere between thirty and forty uh, ca capacity to accommodate somewhere between thirty and forty bicycles. Um, how did you figure that out? How did you figure that was enough? Is it, or how did you figure that you would allocate that number and not ten or a hundred? We were given a number from uh, the school staff. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, I guess that ends that discussion. <laughs> and we, and we, you know, there's certainly room to to accommodate more. It seems to me that we should uh, expect that there would be provision for not only accommodating more, but also for uh, uh, for, for in in the future for the to provide shelter. I know providing bathrooms and so forth is a good idea too, particularly if staff are going to use them. But that may be a that's a, that's a whole another order of magnitude. But uh, figuring out how we could uh, um, double or triple the bicycle accommodation. Um, I mean, if we just look at schools in other countries, and perhaps uh, I know I used to look at buildings in Europe and so forth, and that was twenty or thirty years ago, and we're doing similar things now that they were doing a long time before us. And if the same is true of uh, uh, of non-vehicular transport, uh, we should be ready for that, uh, or at least not do things that would stop it from happening. I don't know whether we can would how we would condition this, but I certainly would like to see. Uh, um, the the possibility of readily uh, doubling or tripling that bicycle accommodation and 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 sheltering some of it. All right, all right, Bruce. Um, you know, I mean, as I look at the plan, I can see what look like opportunities to, you know, to extend or install bicycle racks that would just increase capacity. Um, I guess you'll need to think about whether we should make some sort of condition and uh, you know maybe require a, a revised site plan that shows uh, locations for future additional bike racks or something like that. Janet. I have sort of a general comment that um, there's a lot of space on this site I mean, there's a lot of space to the south of, you know, the bus entrances. Um, there's some nice landscape space um, between the southern part of the parking lot and then the bus lanes, which I'm sure almost no one will ever use because no one uses it now. Um, so, I, you know, I think of when I think about where we could put things or extra parking or things like that, I just think, oh, let's maybe you can just move it around a little, which could, I, of course, drive the designers insane. But I just think there's a lot of flexibility on the site. Um, I have a question, a really specific question by the entrance, the Southern entrance, like there's, there, I don't know if this is just intentional or not, but there seems to be like a path all the way along the bus drop off, but then it stops and it's green um, right by the building. Is that intentional? Do you mean to stop the walkway there? Yeah, that spot um, right there. I, I should, that is a, a drawing error, this error. This square yeah. is paved. It is not green. Uh, and it was not an intentional sleight of hand. It's just a graphic error. This is where the transformer, the dumpsters, um, uh, it's, it's the service area, uh, the maintenance facilities. Okay. Um, so doors here, and this is all paved. And there's a screen wall and planting that protected from the entrance. 
Oh, okay. And then the 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 entrance to is to the right then where the buses drop the kids off, right? Or correct. There is a door right here for student access, which is uh walking through a stair that takes you immediately to all three floors. So if someone came out that entrance and made a, a right hand turn towards the parking lot or just towards um Southeast Street, would they would they just walk into a building or is there no sidewalk along the road there in that square? No, it's continuously paved from here to here. Oh, okay, okay, forget it then. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Okay, here's a couple. Chris, go ahead. So I just wanted to mention that we have a full size set of drawings here in the office and it's really good to look at. So if anybody wants to come in and look at that set, um, I'd be happy to spend time with them um, because it does show a lot of details and it's hard to see some of the details on the set that um, you received in your packet. And it's also hard to, um, you know, manip manipulate the computer to see everything because it kind of loads slowly. So. Um, feel free to let me know if you want to come in and look at the big set, and it may answer, you know, a lot of your questions. And Chris, um, assuming we don't get through everything tonight, um, when are you thinking we would continue this hearing to, so that we kind of have a sense of how long it will be before, you know, during which we can think about coming in to look at the set? Uh, and it not be too late to bother. I would have to ask Pam for her advice on that. We have upcoming meetings on January 31st, February 7th, and February 21st. The January 31st um, <clears throat> meeting is uh, going to be about Hickory Ridge, and I expect that's going to take some time, and we'll also probably want to talk about University Drive. But I believe that February 7th would be a possibility for continuing this public hearing. Um, and then there's also February 21st, as I said. Okay. Do you or do you know if uh, we are on the project's critical path at this point? Is there urgency to us getting through our review? So, uh, the early site package, which is clearing the ground uh, south of the construction fence, is already on the street going out to bid the contract will be awarded in February. That being said, the design for the final situation, uh, all, all layout of everything, that project will go out to bid in July. Um, there are certain deadlines that we have to meet in terms of MSBA review and a lot of other things. Uh, but uh, our general position is that the sooner the better but obviously we're happy to work with you on your schedule. Okay. And um, I guess in terms of the, the two special permit uh, applications that, that we know about, you know, the, the height and the fill, mm -hmm. um, I assume uh, if we were to deny those, that would basically blow up the project. Is that right? That is a fair statement. Okay. No pressure. Uh, Bruce. Uh, I've got quite a few questions, uh, but uh, let me ask one first, which is relates to the traffic. Um, We've looked at the way the traffic will eventually uh, be managed, and in my mind, it seems to be uh, rather thoughtful and somewhat ingenious, and certainly uh, better than was feared when this site was uh, first being thought of in comparison to, say, Wildwood. But um, there is a moment in time, uh, basically, um, between the time when the school building is uh, completed the building itself and operational as far as having students in it and the period when uh, the existing building has been torn down and the north entrance essentially is not available so um, I, I wanted just to find out what's the plan for that period how long is that period and what's the plan for that period 
um, it's obviously going to be suboptimal, but I think we should know how suboptimal. So yeah. in the period after the school is built and they are demolishing um, the existing Fort River School and constructing the parking lot north of this line, um, there are accommodations for temporary connection between which will allow half of the parking that is constructed to be used and the drop off of the south. That being said, there will be a deficit of a good number of cars uh, for the new building. Um, and we are working with the district to figure out how that will happen, whether it's um, part of this is constructed during the phase one and it will exist in the state of a binder course, but not totally finished, but usable for parking for staff or if for a few months, staff has to be parking offsite. Uh, we understand that it is a, a difficult and logistically uh, problematic situation for September to potentially December of 2026, but it's something that we will work out with the district. All right, Bruce. Can I keep going? Sure. Um, there's a generator. Um, uh, down on the, uh, well, near that white building there. Um, this is a net zero energy building, uh, but we the one thing that's not uh, uh, non-fossil fuel is the generator. Um, it's going to be fairly close to residential uh, properties, um, but uh, there's apparently uh, um, some kind of sound enclosure. So I just wanted to uh, understand what uh, uh, what this what this what the DB level of this generator is likely to be, how often it's likely to be in operation. Presumably, that hopefully never, but it's also it's got to be tested regularly. So that'll probably be the major operation. Uh, so what is the expected uh, uh, times of operation? How loud is it? And what is the sound enclosure that's uh, referenced? It will have to be exercised once a week, I believe. Uh, I, I can get you the other information. I don't want to give you a decibel number and be wrong. Um, Rick, I don't know if you know. I don't have offhand, but yeah, we, have, have. we have an acoustic consultant that is also looking at offsite uh, <clears throat> acoustic uh, issues from all the equipment uh, and the generator enclosure is, is one of them. And uh, it would, it will be sufficiently quiet and meet those uh, requirements. And the, there is flexibility as to when it's exercised. So it's <clears throat> whenever they decide to, to run it, if a neighbor complains and I'd be surprised if they did, because they will likely not hear it run. It's, it's a, it's a diesel engine uh, is is what the sound would be. And uh, they can certainly, it's on an automatic timer for, for the exercising and it can be done at any time. And it can be done at a time when it's uh, not uh, obtrusive at all. Okay. What about the sound enclosure? It looks like the building itself is going to perform some sort of blocking at least. Well, in the, in one direction, the building will block it. Uh, another direction, we have uh, fencing around it, and the acoustic enclosure itself is a mitigating factor for the for the engine noise. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Doug, shall I continue? I think so. Sure. Um, We've got comments from the fire department and there are, they really come in the form of what I would have thought looked like conditions, there's stipulations and there's, well, I can't count them all out, but there looks very really close to uh, 15 or more. And, uh, and I'm not sure how this, uh, how we're expected to deal with this or whether we don't need to at all. Um, one one thought that I had was, is, are we supposed to make a condition of any approval that all of these uh, 
uh, requirements in the fire department memo shall be met. Um, and uh, so I guess I could start by asking, uh, has the design team uh, seen this, reviewed this, and are there any, uh, uh, because for example, 2C, it says a fire hydrant, no, it doesn't, I beg your pardon. It says a hydrant shall be added to the south side of the new school and shall be within 100 feet of the new fire department connection. Um, it was this is this, for example, uh, a part of the uh, current scope, or is this an additional item? And are there any other items on the fire department uh, transmittal that are a surprise uh, and will cause difficulty? Or is this, uh, as far as the design team concerned, something that is uh, more or less perfunctory and that we you'll just make sure it all happens? Um, we have seen the memo. Uh, the, the result of many of these items is a meeting that we have about multiple meetings that actually we've had with our engineers and the fire department. We've discussed the locations of hydrants, um, the locations of knock boxes, adjustable panels, and all of that has been uh, discussed for them. And the uh, best location in the building from their point of view um, I don't want to say it's perfunctory, but we, we are certainly going to do all of this. And one thing that they have requested in here is a stamped turning movement analysis. We've done some, but we will do a final one that makes sure all of their equipment uh, gets the 360 degree access to the building that the site is designed to provide. Okay. Um... Well, we can discuss amongst the board, I guess, how we handle this, but it doesn't sound like it's gener it's, it's, it's problematic in any way. Uh, Doug, shall I continue? Yes, Bruce. Um, the, uh, we have uh, something that hasn't been shown or discussed or mentioned, but certainly exists, albeit uh, below ground and you can't see it, um, is the uh, so-called geothermal well, but basically the ground connection for the uh, system that's heating and cooling the whole building, which is taking heat from and delivering heat back to, depending on the season. I think it would be good for us to know where that is and what the extent of it is and, and uh, what it means to have one. Sure. Um, south of the building, east of the entrance uh, at Stair B that we've been talking about. Essentially from here to here, there is an array of 84 wells that will be about 500 feet deep um, with a uh, steel casing and a polyethylene loop in them, which will bring all of that piping back to a vault, which is south of the building. All of this is completely underground and unseen um, and unlikely ever to be accessed um, and then that system will be connected to a heat pump in the uh, mechanical room on the third floor uh, so this system will function as a heat sink uh, in the summer heat will be pumped into the ground and winter um, heat will be extracted from uh, the relatively constant uh, surface temperature of the earth um, and mm -hmm. then all of that, he will boot bar to a water to a water heat exchanger, heat pump in the building. It's 84 uh, wells, 270 tons, I believe. Uh, and is it a balanced capacity. annual load? Uh, yes. Huh. Uh, I mean, yeah, as you're alluding to the geothermal systems, if you're drawing too much heat or putting too much into heat, eventually they become less efficient. Uh, but it is a balanced annual load. Uh, we've had... Uh, Tim Roots, uh, Wellspring is our uh, engineer who was handling the design of the system. Okay. More, Bruce? Yes, uh, one or two, let's say. Um, in, I can't remember which drawing it is, Tim, but in the uh, crosswalk at the uh, southern end of the uh, parking area, just south of the uh, array structure, there is a note that says detectable warning panel. And then it says typical. So first of all, I don't know what a detectable warming, warning panel is. And because it says typical, I imagine there's more than one of them around the place. So could you tell me what it is and where they are and why sure. they are? Uh, it is the tactile surface at any crosswalk. And maybe Bill can explain it, in, but it's the bumps on the sidewalk where as you cross the street. But I'm sure oh. Bill will give you a much more technical 
uh, okay. description. I, I got it now, yes, okay. And then also in areas where there's flush curbing, for instance, uh, along the van drop-off zone, we have a flush condition with bollards. The bollards protect uh, the pedestrians. That curb is flush and it gives someone who is disabled or has trouble uh, seeing, um, it gives them a warning that they're about to enter a vehicular zone. Thank you. And if I may, Doug, one more? Certainly, Bruce. Let's get through them. <laughs> um, the existing athletic field has light poles, which are to be removed. Um, and uh, um, I've, uh, I've, I've mentioned uh, to the uh, building committee a number of times, I say, what's going to happen to those? And I, I get vague answers, which basically indicate that people aren't terribly interested, I think, or concerned. They're, of course, understandably, there's a huge project and there's all sorts of fish to fry and, 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 and silly old 40-year-old uh, uh, wooden poles uh, don't quite uh, uh, pass muster or get, get, get a Guernsey. But I think I know that these are a valuable resource. They don't look like it, but they're probably about, I don't know, 12 or 15 inches in diameter at the base. They probably go into the ground, but it's only the above ground portion that I'm interested in. And they come up, I don't know, 40 plus feet high, maybe 50. And there's half a dozen of them. And it seems to me that uh, the wood resource in this is valuable. It's probably as it often is, poles that were put in that time ago, that the quality of the lumber is much better than we could source today, and that we shouldn't just trash them. And uh, I would like to think that uh, these poles were going to be uh, um, cut down, uh, I mean, lifted and cut and lowered down, perhaps sectioned into two uh, or three 16 plus foot pieces, and uh, taken to the perimeter of the site and stacked and uh, made available uh, to someone. Um, uh, I will probably propose a condition to achieve something like that, but uh, I want to uh, just uh, have a, uh, the, the, the design team say, what are, the, are there any problems with that? I mean, uh, uh, you possibly know more about what the quality of this wood is than I do. So is what I'm is is what I see as a resource uh, and something that can be uh, salvaged. Um, is this, um, am I looking at, a, uh, is this something that's worth pursuing or should we uh, uh, just let the dumpster take care of it? Uh, my father-in-law was a lineman for electric and gas and you'd be surprised what they could make out of old poles. Uh, but we, I had a very, pointed conversation with both uh, Rupert and Guilford about what they wanted to retain on site. And as far as those uh, light poles, uh, the, the lights themselves and all the controllers are being saved for future reuse. We discussed the notion that uh, the poles could be, you know, the part that's not buried, uh, you know, you could end up with a, 10 foot shorter pole and does the town have any use for them? And while they have taken delivery of any unused curb and things like that, the town has expressed no interest in finding a use for those poles. And I believe that a light pole is, is uh, treated against rot. And I don't think that you can saw it for lumber, but that's just uh, a supposition on my part. I've seen a lot of uh, utility poles leaching tar and creosote. So I don't, I think that if somebody had a use for them as, as poles would be number one. Unfortunately, the town's not ready to take on storing those for future use anywhere. Um uh what i did tonight on the way back is i called a friend of mine tom harris who's uh, one of the regional uh, uh entities that uh, fossicks around and 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 gets stuff like this and saws them up and sells it uh sells the lumber back into uh 
into into the uh, into the cabinet industry and various others and uh, at a at a, an astonishing price. So if these are not treated, um, they're probably worth something, and obviously apparently not to the town. But that doesn't mean that they're not worth something to somebody. I think uh, what I will do is I will in the next two or three weeks, to whether the went to up until when we can continue this meeting, if we do, which we will, I'm sure. Uh, I'll see if I can find uh, somebody who's interested in this. And if I can find somebody who's interested in these polls, I'm going to propose a condition uh, that uh, commits the project to at least uh, putting them in a place where that party can collect them. Okay, Bruce. I think that's it for me now. Okay. Thank you for your apparently very close review of the drawings. Janet, you've been very patient. Thank you. Um, I have a punch list too. Um, mm -hmm. I look at the parking lot in the north part and you know, cognizant that this is gonna be many more, um, this is the larger school than what we're used to seeing. Um, and I picture like after school events and you know, little, little siblings and going to events and running through a parking lot that has rows upon rows of cars, but there's no, I, there's no islands, there's no trees, there's nothing to slow kids down. I'd be happy then for a little kid to, you know, basically run into a granite curb, fall on some dirt, then run across, you know, four lanes, you know, several lanes of traffic and park cars. And so, you know, I, I know there's a waiver of the condition for um, having, you know, islands and landscaping. I don't think this is a safe parking lot for small children. And um, I just you know, it's just, it's a lot of rows of cars. It's, you know, so, you know, a lot of traffic coming in and out and there's no, you know, all these cars will be parked and some little kid could just dart out and no one's going to see them. And so I would love to see this redesigned or, you know, in a way that, you know, the current parking lot doesn't have, um, it sort of splits in two. There's a granite curb with some dirt that divides it. And, you know, the kids can, or adults kind of step up onto it, stop for a minute and look and then step down. And so I would love to see this parking lot a little more attractive following the code a little better. Um, the trees would be nice to prevent sort of a heat island effect. I would love to see a solar canopy, but that may be way in the future. So I just don't think this design is particularly safe with so many parked cars and sort of an easy way for young children to run kind of unseen between cars and nothing really, no place to stop. Um, the next thing is, um, you know, there's also a request for a waiver of an, like a screening of the homes. And I don't really understand that because it seems to me, um, you know, this is going to be an attractive school, a parking lot, not so attractive. You know, I think it'd be relatively easy to put in, um, you know, an evergreen screening around the homes, you know, to kind of give them year round, no view of the parking lot and things like that. Um, so those are two kind of landscaping things I'd like to see in the next round. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the special permit that you haven't asked for, for the parking lot canopy, I think you could, if you're just trying to put the canopy in, I think you could put it over that kind of cross piece walkway, or you can just add it later. Like, as I remember the bylaw and voting on it in town meeting, you know, net zero doesn't mean to, doesn't mean that the site has to produce every, you know, ion or whatever of electron of energy, but that you can actually buy green energy also to fill that gap. And so I, I would see if, you know, extending the canopy a little bigger over the, the parking area um, to the north, with the idea that it would go in later or maybe you know you could put it in you know when you know at some other you know either put it in to cover that kind of walkway or just add it later when you're working on the parking lot so i, I just think the net zero thing like having everything turnkey jammed on that little site may not be the best thing particularly for the neighbors who are in the backyard who are now just staring at you know, a lot of um, solar arrays, which I know from being on the solar bylaw working group isn't everybody's favorite thing. And so I would just, those are sort of things I think you might look at for the next round. All right, Janet, uh, I'm gonna ask you one question about your first comment about the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, so at least the way I read it, it looks like there's four rows of cars. 
I think so. It's hard for me to see it. And, yeah. and that reminds me that the, that's basically the same as the parking lot at Mill River, which I've never really felt like it was terribly unsafe. How many, how many spaces are it, here? It is four rows of cars. It's 175 spaces. All right. So, I mean, it's definitely longer than Mill River, that's for sure. But, I, but in terms of the width and the direction that people would be walking, you know, to get to the fields, it's not that different. And anyway, I just kind of mentioned it. Um, I also have wondered about those waivers for the, uh, for the parking, um, you know, in terms of the islands and that kind of thing. Um, you know, coming kind of on the heels of our conversation about Hickory Ridge, where there was also a conversation about getting rid of some of the, or it, waiving some of the parking requirements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it starts to feel like when we have a town project, uh, some of the parking requirements are sort of optional. And um, I'm not sure I, I really am, and I'm not really sure I'm, I'm comfortable creating a, creating that precedent. <laughs> so yeah. um, anyway, not, um, yeah, and there's, I think there's space, you know, to put some, you know, some landscaping in there, making it more attractive. It could be also a place where water goes and the trees help hold the water on the site, you know. Um, but I just, I just, it just seems really big. And I just picture kids scurrying. And I understand what you're saying about Mill River, but you know, this parking lot's going to be used at night for school events or, mm -hmm. you know, night, which is sometimes 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, and, you know, parents are distracted and, you know, kids run. Right. Um, I guess, uh, Tim, I, Janet's comment also makes me wonder uh, for the green sort of swale that's between that main parking area and the drop-off drive, is that easily traversed by a pedestrian? It, it's not so steep and slow. No, that, that's that's not that's not easily uh, traversed by a pedestrian because that whole zone is depressed slightly in order to hold water. But there oh. is a sidewalk that extends the full length of that sand filter and swale from the north end of the parking lot. So if you have gotten from the parking spaces to that green zone, you are on a safe, separated sidewalk that will bring you all the way to the crosswalk to the entrance. Right. I guess I guess what I'm thinking about is there's there's a second uh, desire line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, for not for people who are headed to the main entrance of the school, but for people who are headed to the ball field for their, you know, their softball league or or the ultimate frisbee league that's happening on Saturdays. And so that green swale is actually a barrier for a pedestrian. Is that right? Well, it is, but there's two connectors. So right. the northern part of the parking area, which I would imagine where, where most people would be parking, there's a sidewalk that takes you towards the east, and there is not a there is a crosswalk there. It's not shown on the drawing that takes you over to the fields. Uh huh. And then there's one at the south end. Yes. Yeah. How difficult would it be to put one in the middle? Um, can, I, can I add one thing? Yes, please, Janet. Uh, so the the upper sand filter is about two feet deep, and the side slopes are around three to one. So though it's like a kid, it's only going to have water in it during a rain event and for, you know, 24, 48 hours after a heavy rain event, kids will go through it. Um, we're not totally expecting them not to it's not so deep that they can't it's okay it, you know, they'll run up and they'll run down and we don't really want them to because it's planted and you know it's that the goal of it is to function but we won't be surprised when they do okay and and the slope of it to clarify is not sloping immediately down from the edge there's a flat area at 
just to describe the profile there's there's not a sidewalk on the on the drop off side but there's a flat area uh-huh. uh, the dimensions of which maybe Janet or Steve can but it's 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 how it's built okay yeah i mean just looking at your rendering it's not obvious that that's you know uh got some gradient to it so Okay, uh, Janet, go ahead. You're 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 muted. Yeah, that's basically it. I just think um, planting screenings slow, you know, some, make this parking lot more attractive and safer for people to move through. Um, you know, if you have a kind of a little island, you know, like I've stood on those islands waiting for cars to go by. You know, you feel a little better when you're up, you know, up in the air a little bit. Um, but I just, I just think, you know, let's follow the bylaw and make that a little prettier. I mean, the rest of the site looks really nice. And also there's this big asphalt expanse. I just don't think it's safe. And I don't think it's particularly attractive. And I think you have space to do stuff with it, you know. Um, Can I make a comment relative to the screening? Sure, Bill. Um, when we designed the parking lot, we took great care in not disturbing the buffer between the parking lot and the property line. So the trees that are sh that are currently in that area, they all remain. Um, we can look at it, but I think it's gonna be hard for us to put a, an evergreen screen in um, without disturbing the trees that are existing that are there. So that's why we didn't show any screening in there in that area because we preserved what was there. Um, but yeah. we certainly can take a look to see if we can add uh, some screening in that area without disturbing the existing vegetation. No, I think it's a great idea. And I'll, I'll go back and look myself because I'm not sure what it looks like in the winter. I mean, I think there are evergreens in there and it is, it's very- really, There are some, yes. Yeah. There's a real separation between those houses and the school. And I think that's a nice thing to preserve. Yeah. And there is also a berm, which I'll admit this is the first time I've been at when there were not leaves on the trees for the probably southern two thirds of the lot. So uh, one of the acceptable ways to mitigate uh, in the code is a berm that is at least three feet high to block headlights. And that exists uh, if you look from the south end of the parking lot to at least to the middle and probably a little bit north. OK, I'll, I'll look at that again. Yeah. Thank you. And if I could just add, uh, looking at that whole area that's north of the school, there seems to be a lot of real estate up there, and it seems like you slide things around. Uh, but the width of that athletic field, every foot, east and west and north and south, was hard fought so that they could do overlays of alternate Frisbee and the various games. Then you get to the east and you get into the uh, replication areas and not wanting to or not being able to get farther into the uh, wetland jurisdictional area. You, we've got a, a two lane access road that we want to have well spaced from the edge of the play field. And then the sand filter have a certain width. So when the design team says, we'll look at seeing if we can fit some planting in there. It's moving everything over 10 feet isn't the solution to getting it there because every, it seems funny to say with that width, but everything that everybody was advocating for is jammed in there. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else, Janet? No, no, thank you. Okay, all right. Thanks. All right. Um, I guess, let's see, we only have two attendees left and I think they are both for our next item on the agenda. So I'm not even gonna ask for public comment at this time. Um, Bruce, actually Rick, you got your hand up first. Okay, Bruce. Um, I was simply going to move a continuation to um, if Pam has got the answer. I think uh, it was February 7th, wasn't it? 
uh, move continuation of the public hearing to uh, February the 7th uh, at um, 6.45, I suppose. I think that's uh, all. Uh, uh, Chris, I think that's all that's necessary. Yeah, Chris, does does that uh, six forty five work for you? Should we make it a little bit sooner so that we don't have to wait to, uh, you know, get to the clock to six forty five? I think we usually have public hearings scheduled for six thirty five, and we may not get to them right away. Okay, we get to them sooner than six forty five. So I would say six thirty five is a good. 635 is fine. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to second your motion, Bruce. Um, any 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 uh, comments from the board that you need to make tonight, as opposed to in a couple of weeks? Not seeing any. All right, then why don't we uh, run through a Roll call to continue to February 7th at 6.35. Bruce? Aye. All right. We get our list. Jesse? Aye. Uh, Janet? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. I'm an aye as well. All right, the motion passes, five in favor, two absent. The time now is 9.19. So thank you, Denisco, and all your uh, associated consultants. Appreciate your work on this. And uh, we hope to see many of you, at least, uh, in a few weeks. We will. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right, we'll now go to the next item on the agenda, which is actually old business, topics not reasonably anticipated. Do we have, any, have old, anything. any old business? No, we do not. Uh, Janet. Looks like Janet might. I, it's actually it's a it's not old business. It's a it's a question about. Um, I was wondering when Dodson Flinker is going to start its consulting work on the design review guidelines for downtown. Is there kind of a work plan? And then um, a very strong suggestion that maybe we put this on the planning board website because I think it's going to have a lot of interest in people and um, you know listed as a current project and maybe some way people can glue in or. I don't know, offer comments or just see what's going on. Um, I just think there's going to be a lot of interest in this. So, but the first question is, when does it start and what do they do? What are they doing? It started today and Nate can talk about it if he wants to, but um, I, I believe that their task is to try to sort out a schedule that is slightly different from the schedule that they had proposed in their response to the RFP because of some constraints that we have with one of our grants. So um, they're going to be moving, he moving ahead to uh, propose a work plan. Um, we do have an idea that we want to put um, this project on our town website. Um, we haven't quite um, decided that yet, but Engage Amherst um, is a subscription and it is renewed every year. And so this project is a at least uh, it is a two-year project, so we're not sure that Engage Amherst is going to be the right platform for that, but we haven't quite made that decision. But Nate may have more to offer on this topic because he's really the person in charge of the project. Nate? Yeah, I think Dotson's, um, they're looking through existing conditions, um, documents, you know, they're coming up with a timeline and schedule, so we'll, we're meeting with them in a um, two to three weeks to kind of um, get that set up. They'd like to have a working group, a uh, stakeholder group that they'd meet with, you know, four to five, six times in addition to, you know, um, outreach meetings. So they, you know, they like to have kind of this stakeholder group meet with them initially and then throughout the process um, to um, work through ideas. And this is in addition to kind of the whole outreach, you know, phase. So they're hoping to do, you know, a, a visual preference survey, stakeholder meetings, public meetings, 
uh, different things, you know, um, this spring and in the summer. And so, uh, you know, they're kind of outlining all that and we'll try to get that going in the next few weeks. As Chris mentioned, we do have a community planning grant for streetscape standards. We need to have a report um, kind of in a rough draft by the end of June. And so their focus really is on kind of a visioning and community engagement. And then the streetscape piece, you know, um, have something going by July and then, you know, continue working on both, you know, kind of the building and site design standards and, you know, more kind of visioning and things throughout the summer and, you know, into the winter. And so, um, you know, I think it, we've given 18, an 18 month timeline. And so, you know, although it seems like it's a long time, you know, to kind of set it, yeah, I know to put it all together and then have an iterative process where we review things and, it, you know, um, it'll uh, go. So they have a, a pretty, they have a, a, you know, they have a timeline and a task, you know, a kind of a chart and they're modifying that and we hope to kind of finalize that soon and then we can uh, figure it out. I, I agree with Chris. I think the, <clears throat> Um, engage Amherst may not, you know, we don't want to have a, put it on a platform that we then have to migrate from. Um, so we'll probably put it on the web, on the um, town's website under the planning department or planning board, wherever it can be linked multiple ways. Um, and then, you know, as documents get, um, you know, generated, they can be up there. We can try to figure out how we want to receive public comment. And uh, yeah, so that's something where we're, we, we discussed a little bit today. So we have a few few things to have homework on for staff and they have some homework as well. Okay. You're, you're muted, uh, Janet. Oh, Janet, yes, you are uh, muted. I think it'd be great to put on the planning department or planning board is like under the new projects thing. Cause I think the new project we have is like 11 East Pleasant Street. And I, I know, you know, it'd be good to have a few places people could look for it, so. All right, maybe good. we'll hear an, hear an update uh, at our next meeting or maybe two meetings from now. All right, um, so that was it for old business. Now we'll move to new business. Time is 9.24. First item is request for determination of applicability on Pelham Road. Um, oh, I can speak to that. Um, sure. I really just gave this to you because it's an interesting project. We don't always send you um, the request for determination or we would be sending you things all the time. This is something that was received by the Conservation Commission and they're required to send um, material like this, this applicant uh, to the planning board. But as I said, you know, many of these things are not a, of interest to the planning board. Um, but this one I think is interesting because it's the remnants of an old coal gasification plant that was um, located at the intersection of Pelham Road and the Fort River. I think it might have been on both sides of the road. And um, the town has been struggling with this for years, trying to um, trying to remove any kind of contaminants and then monitor for um, you know, what's happening to the contaminants. So this is really just a request for determination of ac applicability, which means that um, the applicant is requesting um, for the Conservation Commission to approve wetland limit lines in this vicinity. And then um, I imagine they will be applying for notice of intent to put um, soil boring locations. They wanna locate 13 soil borings. Um, and this will help them to determine how much of uh, the, the material that is uh, contaminated is still there. Um, you can see that there are two little huts, I guess, one on the south side of Pelham Road. Is that right? The south side, yeah, um, is a little greenhouse. And on the other side, there may be a structure as well. And it's also um, got a chain link fence around part of it, I think. Um, but anyway, they have been monitoring this for years, pretty much ever since I started working in the in the planning department. And it's an interesting project to follow. And I know you will see it when you drive down Pelham Road. It's nothing that you have to do anything with, but I just thought it would be interesting for you to know about it and to know that um, the town is continuing to monitor these um, this situation. All right. Well, then I guess I was mistaken that Tom Reedy was waiting for this project to come up. He was just enjoying our earlier conversation, I guess. 
Oh, he he may have been interested in the uh, Fort River project because um, his office is right next to Fort River, so he's a an abutter. Um, uh -huh. So he may have been listening so he could get more information about the project. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any other new business? None that I know of. All right. Any Form A, A and R subdivision applications? None. Any upcoming ZBA applications that we might be interested in? I don't have any to share. I'm not sure if my other colleagues do. Not at this time. OK. Other than the ones that are required for the <laughs> Fort River School, which we already talked right. about. Right. Um, OK, then moving on, upcoming SBP, SPR, and SUB applications. Nothing really. Nope. Nothing new. We haven't received okay. anything. All right. All right, and uh, time is 9.28, and we will go to the committee and liaison reports. Bruce, anything from? Oh, actually, uh, uh, no, nothing to report on that. But uh, I suddenly realize I have a question. Um, I uh, Can I, uh, this is jumping back to the previous uh, business, can I ask my question? It's about the... Uh, um, uh, Olympia Drive project, which we approved uh, almost a year and a half ago, and, and the site has not been disturbed. And I wonder whether we know anything about why they have not moved forward uh, and whether they're intending perhaps to do something similar to what they did with Spring Street and, and redesign the thing to a whole lot, uh, you know, to a lot of different uh, types of units. Uh, I, I, it suddenly occurred to me to ask that question. I hope that's in order. Otherwise, we can put it off until next time. Well, I, you've asked the question. Chris, do you, have, you know what's going on? I haven't spoken with them about that project um, in a long time. I don't know if uh, either of my colleagues has spoken with them. Nate? No, but I know they're busy you know, with trying to finish up Spring Street and 11 to 13 East Pleasant. So it might just be, uh, you know, and other things. So there might be a, you know, order of priority and, you know, I haven't heard that it's not happening. I just think it's delayed with their other projects. Good enough. Okay. No, nothing to report on uh, PVPC. All right. Um, I think that since our last meeting in December, uh, CPAC did meet and approved uh, most of the projects that were uh, that applied for money this this time around. Um, there was some trimming of budgets, most of it proposed by Dave Zomek and other folks at the town uh, on town projects. Um, but it seemed like a pretty smooth process this, this year. Karin is not here to talk to us about the design review board. Chris, anything on CRC? I understand that there's still, um, well, I should back up and say CRC has been repopulated. Um, it has, I think, four of the same members and one new member. So Jennifer Taub, Pam Rooney, Pat DeAngelis, and who am I missing? Mandy Jo. Mandy Jo. Oh. And the most, <laughs> the, I shouldn't forget her. No, because she was the chair. Um, then at Frika oh. Ete is uh, also joining. So um, we haven't worked with them yet. I think that they did have a meeting recently and they're picking up the, I haven't worked with them yet, but um, they're picking up the rental registration project and trying to move that forward. And is the solar bylaw with that committee as well? The solar bylaw is also with that committee, but again, they haven't um, done any work on that one yet. Okay. And is there any statutory uh, deadline for them to move that out of committee? Yes, June. Okay. They were given a deadline of June. Yep. Great. All right. Um, I guess that's, that's all our committee and liaison reports. Uh, I as chair have no, no report tonight. Chris, Pam, any report from staff? Have you got a new staff member? 
No, um, and I'm not sure. I don't think that uh, it's been advertised yet. I did send it down to HR in December, so we're going to have to um, give them a nudge, shake them up a bit. Yep. Right. Let's get you some help. Um, okay. All right. Well, we didn't quite make 930, but the time is 932. Uh, unless anybody else has any uh, anything to say, we can adjourn. I will say, please do try to go and look at the drawings. I think that would be, I know I, I haven't done that yet, and I feel the need after tonight's conversation, particularly all the good questions that Bruce noticed that I wouldn't have had a clue about, but. Uh, yeah, and I have to say that we didn't give you the whole set of drawings. We gave you about two thirds of it because it was just too much of a monumental package. So right. um, there may be things that would be enlightening to you. Like, I don't think I included the grading plans. People who look online can look at the grading plans, but I don't think I included them in the, in the paper packets. So looking at the drawings live and in full size is really a good, uh, good exercise. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I it's probably uh, tell me if it's out of turn because we closed or continued the hearing. But would the Wildwood site have required as many special permits and waivers? I think probably in the end it would have. Um, we okay. didn't really scrutinize this project until fairly recently. So when the site was being chosen, you know, they were asking us, well, what kind of permits do you need? And the site hadn't been designed yet. So we didn't know that it was going to be 43 feet. And we didn't know, you know, necessarily that it was going to be in the FPC zoning district. And, you know, so there were a number of things that only came to light once the thing was designed. And... So I think, uh, you know, as I said, we don't really scrutinize these projects until we get an application and then we really look at them closely. But before that, um, you know, our, our, our review is a more cursory review. Right. It, well, it would have been, uh, it would have been uh, equivalently challenging from a traffic management point of view. The issues would have been different, but... Uh, uh, they were similar uh, mm -hmm. in extent. Uh, the site is much more compact, so there would have been issues. Dry. And of course, it's a uh, sloping site, quite extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of fill on that site, actually, uh, uncompacted fill that the building would have been going over. I, I can imagine that, uh, I suppose that may not have manifested itself in, in uh, permit related <laughs> questions before us but the challenges of those uh, of the wildwood site were considerable the only yeah, way I was gonna say, really given the zoning was... district i think it would be the same in terms of height you know it could be coverage mm -hmm. setbacks okay fill, fill um parking so you know i just so think that had to you know, design both yeah. sites and present them to the planning department for thorough scrutiny in order to know what kinds of permits might have been required for wildwood uh-huh Okay. Well, I guess I, you know, it's just sort of in the back of my mind, like, well, what, what choice do we have? We have to approve this. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so right, far well, as the fill is note, concerned, I think that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise we maybe be able to, the, the sort of things that Janet was pushing for, Rick uh, pushed back. I mean, I have to say, this is an extraordinary uh, uh, design team that they put together. I had my doubts initially. I, uh, I challenged Kathy on one or two points, but Denisco have demonstrated a just extraordinary uh, commitment to this town and to this project, including Donna Denisco, who, as the principal, I thought, well, she'll be there for the first little while. But Donna is at every meeting for two and a half years and doesn't look like stopping. Uh, they chase down every ferret. Uh, uh, they... Uh, uh, respond to public uh, comments and so forth uh, um, considerably, assiduously, you know, carefully, and so forth. They're just uh, they're just a wonderful uh, uh, group of people, and uh, we're very fortunate to have them. Okay, that's my view, anyway. Well, thank you for that endorsement. All right. Well, on that positive note, we can adjourn. Time is nine thirty-seven. Welcome back in 2024. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you everybody. all. Have a okay. good night. Bye-bye. Chris?
Can yeah. I ask you? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, 